Okay, do we have anything before we bring in the, the panel? Um, just one thing, Your Honor. Uh, yesterday you had indicated that you would like us to print off any of the annotations that were made on the exhibit. Um, we have done that, and I provided Mr. Panic a copy of the one from yesterday, and we've agreed that we'll just pass that to the record as defense exhibit. Okay, we made that A, I believe. Uh, a was the notice of non party production, oh, which is why we made that. B, all right. I see I have in the waiting room witness, I assume. Is this Ellis? <coughs> Got uh, Mr. Timpanic and Mr. Kessler also in the waiting room. I'm going to admit all of these. Mr. Kessler, do you have? Um, are you planning on using um, documents? We are, Your Honor. Uh, okay. Is technology going to do it? So it's best technology? Uh, no, Your Honor. Uh, actually, um, you just have to undo what you just did. And the only thing that I'll need you to do is um, enable screen sharing. Uh, Your Honor, it's still. Showing up on our Zoom screen and the screen in front. There, is that working? Uh, I'm, I'm not clear on what you're saying. Yeah, so I'm. What what happened is our screens in front of us have gone blank, so we can't see the witnesses or anything else, Your Honor. John, come here and see if you can do it. That's it, right?
know, I'm gonna go ahead and try to share share the screen and make it look more like a photo. See if we can get it to work. Here. Well, I'm showing share screen, John. Yep, it is, John. Start to cry, Doc. I got to pull it down here. Okay. Matt, give me an injection of the Not at all. Not at all. <clears throat> yeah, most important thing is so they can actually see the document. So. Okay. Okay. I think we're okay. So. Let's see. Um, Dr. Ellis, can you hear me? Yes. This is Judge Hayworth. Uh, we have the jury outside. We're going to bring him in in just a moment. We'll square you in and get started on the testimony. Okay. Stand by. All right. Bring him in. All right, folks, come on in, take your seats. Continue with testimony, y'all will be seated. So I'm going to ask you again, have any of you been exposed to any outside information concerning the this case, parties, or any incidents that's been discussed here? Has anybody done any research, investigations of your own on any matters here? Okay, I'm not getting a response on that. So we're still in the uh, plaintiff's case. I believe they have another witness to present, uh, Mr. Timpani. Plaintiff called Dr. Wendy Ellis. Dr. Ellis, would you raise your right hand 
do you swear or affirm the testimony you'll give today will be the truth? Yes. To be questioned first by Mr. Timpanic and then someone from the defense. Okay. Good morning, Dr. Ellis. Good morning. Could you please introduce yourself and spell your last name for the record? My name is Wendy Ellis and the spelling of my last name is E-L-L-I-S. And what is your current occupation? I am an emergency veterinarian. And where do you work? Currently, I work at the Veterinary Medical Center in Lakewood Ranch. And on November 18th, 2016, were you working in the same or similar capacity? I was working in very similar capacity. Were you working in Lakewood Ranch? No. Where were you working? I was working at Blue Pearl, Sarasota on Tamiami Trail. And what is your highest level of education? Um, doctorate of Veterinary Medicine. And where did you get your uh, doctorate and your undergraduate degree from? At the University of Georgia. And are you familiar with Candy the dog? I'm familiar with their case, yes. And could you explain to the jury how you are familiar with Candy the dog? I was the veterinarian that first treated her. Uh, could you bring up exhibit one, the first page? <clears throat> and Dr. Ellis, uh, could you tell the jury what you saw Candy the dog for on the day in question? I saw her for a gunshot wound. And could you explain to the jury the um, what observations you made from, obviously, from the medical records? Um, I mean, she came in. Um, I was told she was shot multiple times. We examined her. We placed an IV catheter. We did some workup and some treatments for her. Is and there something? Go ahead. I'm sorry, uh, continue, ma'am. I just didn't know specifically what you were interested in. Uh, can you note for the record the locations of the gunshot wounds? You can refer to your medical records if it would refresh your recollection. So um, it has been a while, but um, I do have the x-ray report in front of me and um, my records as well. And it's a gunshot wound to the left caudal um, thoracic slash cranial abdominal wall. And did you note in your the objective section of your medical records were a second gunshot wound? Um, I suspected a second wound. Um, it shows over the right lateral aspect of the elbow. Mm -hmm. So just basically the outside of the right elbow. And have you, Dr. Ellis, um, in, uh, treated other animals for gunshot wounds? Not very many, but a few over the years. I've been practicing for about 20 years. And could you uh, tell the jury um, what observations you made of Candy's, uh, the dog's demeanor? Um, when she came in, she was pretty quiet. Uh, we just put her on the treatment table and I mean, she, she wasn't doing much. I remember seeing her on the treatment table. She was just, you know, kind of sitting there. She wasn't bright, happy, wagging her tail. She was just kind of quiet and sitting on the table. Okay. Uh, do we bring up page two of this. And in your notes, Doctor, I'd like to turn your attention towards the bottom of the page, uh, WE for Wendy Ellis, 11-18-2016. Could you tell me what you noted in those, and in that uh, moment? Um, at 9.08 p.m., um, I noted that she had vomited blood three times. I had some concern for penetrating stomach wound and probably other injuries and I recommended emergency surgery. And did you, and we'll come back to the um, photograph. Uh, did you see an entrance or an entrance wound? We did see an entrance wound. 
And did you recall seeing an exit wound? No, but I do recall feeling the bullet on the right side of the abdominal wall. In your experiences, what uh, what does it mean when it, a bullet, when there is no exit wound? I mean, it went in and it didn't come out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Did I have exhibit six, picture three? Uh, Dr. Ellis, would that picture be a fair and accurate representation of Candy the dog's right elbow? Yes. And is that the suspected gunshot wound you discussed earlier? Um, yes. And did you at the time make any notations as to why you thought it was a gunshot wound? Um, there weren't any other reported injuries. The owner um, had mentioned that she was shot at multiple times. So without any other reported injuries, we assumed it was a gunshot. And like you said, Earl, you had investigated, you had treated animals for gunshot wounds before. Yes, a handful. There's not many, we don't see many dogs that are shot, to be honest. I mean, over... A period of 20 years, I've probably seen maybe five, seven. I mean, just as a, a guesstimate. Do you recall the demeanor of the dog's owner? Um, he was very concerned. Um, I know he was very worried about his, his car or his uh, flat tire. I mean, he got his dog in there. We started treatment right away. And when we mentioned um, traveling to Tampa for emergency surgery, um, you know, I know he was concerned about his tire. So he was in and out of the building quite a bit that day. Was he also concerned about his dog? Yes, he's very concerned about his dog. May I have a moment, Your Honor? He was concerned about his truck because he wanted to drive to Tampa to be with his dog. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Ms. Johnson? Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Dr. Ellis. My name is Andrea Johnson, and I am one of Zach's attorneys. Good morning. Now, when you said that there were multiple gunshot wounds, that was what you were told, right? Well, yes, but there was a bullet in the cut. Isn't it true that the only definitive gunshot wound that you determined was the one observed on the left thoracic wall of the dog? That is true. I am going to turn your attention to Exhibit 2, document base labeled 17. That will come up on your screen momentarily. Do you recognize this as the radiology report that you were the requesting doctor on? Yes. If you could look. Um, under the section that says right thoracic limb in the middle of the page, that's referring to the right elbow you referenced, correct? Um, is it under which area? It's about the middle of the document in capital letters, right thoracic limb. Okay. 
Oh, yes. Okay. I want to ask you a few questions, and that is the right elbow you had referenced in your direct testimony, right? Yes. If you could look at the second sentence under findings and let me know when you're there. Okay. I want to read the second sentence to you under findings. From the exhibit that's in evidence, the second sentence under findings says there is no evidence of soft tissue swelling or metallic ballistic foreign material. Did I read that correctly? Yes. In other words, there were no bullet fragments in the right elbow, were there? There were none. And of course, there was no bullet in the right elbow. Is that accurate? Yes, there was none that I saw. And so when you testified that there was a bullet wound in the right arm, that was your uh, suspicion, and you're only assuming it, right? Yes, I was suspicious of it, but we can't say 100% for sure. And I want to talk about the one entry wound of the bullet. Is it accurate that it went through the left thoracic wall, which is the left side of the upper chest of the dog? It went through the left caudal chest wall near the ninth rib. And then it, so it went in through there and traveled through the rib. Is that accurate? It went in through the left side at number nine and almost exited through the right side at, I believe, 12 or 13. And ultimately ended up in the abdomen. Um, I don't have the x-rays actually in front of me, but I remember being able to feel the bullet from the outside of the right um, abdominal wall. I am Do you going have, to, yes, I don't I, have. Momentarily, we're going to pull up the x-ray for you. Thank you. See that x-ray in front of you? Yes. And is that um, near the abdomen where the bullet ended up? It looks just caudal to the stomach. And, and when you said you felt it from the outside, um, which side was that on? The right. And uh, based upon your review of the x-rays, isn't it accurate that the bullet traveled from the front of the dog to the back of the dog, ending up in this area? That, it is very subtly from front to back. I mean, it's more from side to side. It entered at number nine on the left side, and it was at number 13 on the right. So it traveled a couple of rib spaces back but it went from the caudal thorax, front of the abdomen, as noted in the radiology report, to um, not much further back on the other side of the pet. Do you recall taking your deposition in this case? I do. Do you recall testifying in your deposition that the entry wound of the bullet traveled uh, from the front of the dog to the back of the dog? He asked me if it traveled from the front to the back, and I did say yes. That was the first time I'd seen those records in years. And I have looked and reviewed the radiology report as well as my records. And if you place it, I have a dog that's 55 pounds myself. And if you place the bullet entering at the ninth left side and exiting at the right 13th, that's more of a side to side wound than a front to back. Although I do agree that it traveled front to back to some degree. Um, approximately, I'm, approximately three to four rib, rib spaces, but it travels from the left side of the dog and almost exits the right side of the dog. So was that in a downward direction? That I cannot answer. Uh, this is difficult. I can't show you your deposition, but I'm using a copy of the transcript. And I can't find it right now. 
directing attention to page 28 of the deposition, starting at line 8. The question was asked of you, so if I understand you correctly, the entrance wound was in the front and then traveled back. Answer, yes. Yeah, I believe I just explained my answer on that part of it. But, I mean, the man is taller that shot her, so I would assume it's probably going to be from a more dorsal point as opposed to from underneath her. Your Honor, may I have a moment? Yes. Dr. Owens, uh, do you see the different x-ray that is in front of you? Yeah. And when x-rays are taken, they're in fact reversed, right? Um, yes, you kind of have to imagine the pet laying on its back. And do you see the uh, bullet in this x-ray? Yes. And can you identify the location of the dog where that bullet is? Um, it's in the... It looks on the left side of the x-ray. Thank you, Your Honor. Peter Rich. No, Your Honor. Witness is excused with thanks to the court. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ellis. Uh, we'll sign off. Thank you. Plaintiff calls Dr. Michael Bond to the stand, Your Honor. Bonda, B O N D A. <clears throat> Doctor, if you'll stand here, please, Madam Clerk, please. Thank you. This way, sir. Good morning, Doctor. Could you please introduce yourself and spell your last name for the record? My name is Dr. Michael Bonda, B-O-N-D-A. And what is your current occupation? I'm a doctor of veterinary medicine. And how long have you been a doctor of veter veterinary medicine? 34 years. And where did you get your doctoral degree and any and undergraduate degree? Undergraduate was Cornell University in New York State, and veterinary was the New York State College of Veterinary Medicine, Cornell University. Oh, and are you familiar with the plaintiff, Rodney Jacobson? Yes. And can you explain to the jury how you are familiar with them, Mr. Jacobson? Uh, Mr. Jacobson and his wife, Cindy Watson, are clients of mine since 2002 at uh, two different veterinary clinics that I've worked at. So would it be fair to say they have been clients of yours for 20 years? Correct. And how many animals have they brought to you over the years? Approximately 30 dogs, two cats, and three pet birds, parrots. And in your practice as a vet, how many animals do you think you've worked on over the last 34 years? 
I see approximately two to 3,000 pets a year. So that would be 60 to 90,000 over 34 years. And are you familiar with Candy the dog? Yes. And can you explain to the jury how you're familiar with her? Yes. Candy was presented to the uh, River Landings Animal Clinic five times from May 2015 to May 2016 for five different uh, health issues that needed to, or uh, problems that needed to be addressed. What observations could you make, uh, did you make of Candy the dog when she was in your care? Uh, I never found her to be a difficult dog to handle or to deal with. She was what we refer to as stoic, which means passive, um, and no aggression. Um, multiple procedures were done, including radiographs, uh, blood samples taken, urine samples taken by a needle placed into the abdomen, stool samples taken with an uncomfortable uh, probe that goes uh, rectally to obtain a stool sample um, and other forms of physical exam on and uh, contact physical exam. And could you explain to the jury what Candy demeanor was like while she was getting blood drawn? Uh, Candy had blood samples taken three times during those five visits. Each blood sample was taken by me personally. Um, each blood sample is taken from the neck or jugular vein, and none of those instances was she a difficult or aggressive a pet to, to work with. And in your experiences, how do animals usually take having their blood drawn? Every pet is different. Uh, young dogs are very wiggly. Um, some dogs are uh, more nervous or scared. Some are more patient, especially if they've had blood samples taken dozens of times, or I've seen them 20, 30 times over the years. Um, uh, and unfortunately, some are aggressive and require other forms of restraint or sedation in order to obtain a, a sample. And was that candy when she had her blood drawn? No, she never required a muzzle or extra restraint or any sedation, just the typical technician and I lifting her onto a table and technician holding her in position and myself drawing the sample. And is it common for a pet owner to bring their pet to your clinic with a pinch collar? I will say uh, several to many do. Um, the uh, pinch collar is a good restraint collar and a non-slip collar. I feel it's important to have a non-slip collar, especially at the practice I work at because we're located right on State Road 70. And if a pet slipped out of a standard collar that uh, doesn't gather up such as a pinch collar, they could easily run across the busy road and become injured. I feel most people who bring, if not all people who bring their pets in with a pinch collar are trying to be responsible to make sure that the pet doesn't uh, pull and become unruly or be difficult for them to handle. Uh, if they pull too hard, they could injure the person, the owner's shoulder. So would it be fair to say you had numerous pet owners put their dogs in pinch collars? Yes, in fact, even my own dog is was in a pinch collar from a dog trainer. And what kind of dog is that? I have an Australian show. May I have a moment, Your Honor? Sure. I have no further questions. Good morning, Dr. Bonda. How are you? Good morning. Very well, thank you. Uh, you would agree with me that responsible pet owners also keep their dogs on leashes as well, correct? Yeah, I can call for speculation. Just saying. Let's talk about the pinch collar in this case. If we can pull up Exhibit 15. Oh, 
In your honor, I think you're going to have to, your honor, I think you're going to have to release control to. Uh, 15. Excuse me, 14. If we can zoom in on the top there. Do you see that exhibit, Dr. Bonda? Yes, I do. This was an x-ray taken at your office, was it not? Correct. No restraint to do testing, because in fact, she had a pinch collar, choker chain, prong collar that she wore on this day that she was getting an x-ray, did she not? The pinch collar wasn't used to restrain her for any of the handling or blood sample. Oh, it wasn't used to restrain her for the urine or the blood sample, but it was used to restrain her for the x-ray. A no. non-intrusive procedure? It was not used. Sorry. You testified that it was not required for a blood sample or urine draw. That's sample. correct. Correct. But nevertheless, it was on the dog in a non-intrusive examination such as an x-ray, correct? That's correct. Okay. And it was not taken off prior to the x-ray, was it? That is correct. And you would agree with me that a pinch collar or choker chain is used for a proper restraint of an animal, correct? Yes. It's to keep dogs under control, correct? I want to talk a little bit about um, the five separate occasions that you treated Candy on. Uh, those visits never lasted longer than a half an hour, correct? Most of my appointments go up to an hour and a half. Okay. Out of the five appointments that you had with Candy, can you sit here today and tell us how long each one of those appointments lasted with Candy? A minimum of 30 minutes. I would say the longest lasted at least an hour and a half because I needed to do take a urine sample, stool sample, blood work, examine the dog for the radiographs, and um, then examine the dog moving up and down the hallway, which can take 10 to 15 minutes itself. Okay. So anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour and a half. That's correct. And how many animals do you see in a day? I have 15 to 20 scheduled appointments each day. How many hours a day do you work? I work approximately 10 hours a day at the clinic. Okay. What are your hours at the clinic? Nine to six, recently changed from nine to five for scheduled appointments, and then procedures are done after hours as well. Do you take lunch breaks? I personally do not take a lunch break. So your hours are nine to six, which would be nine hours in a day, correct? for scheduled appointments. Okay. I'm generally there till seven, eight o'clock each night. You never observed Candy outside of seeing her River Landings Animal Clinic, correct? Correct. And you never saw Candy outside of the presence of Mr. Jacobson or Miss Watson, correct? Correct. You never observed Candy run outside of River Landings Clinic, correct? Not run outside the building, just her gate within the building. Let me go ahead. <coughs> Let's pull up exhibit uh, 13, first page, please. This is Candy, correct? Correct.
If I may have a minute, Your Honor. Dr. Bonda? Yes. How much did Candy weigh? Her first exam, she weighed 52 pounds. Uh, I know another weight was 57 pounds, and I believe her last visit, May of 2016, she was 59 pounds. In May of what year? 2016. Your Honor, at this time, the plaintiff rests its case. All right. Um, so, if you'll take the jury back into the jury room for a few minutes. Jurors exiting. All right, be seated. Um, Mr. Kessler, you've got, uh, you're planning on a couple of witnesses today. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay, and I know you have some motions you want to make. Um, so, your witnesses are, was it Dr. Haup and Mobile Hill? Those are the two witnesses that have to go today, Your Honor. Okay. Um, being the uh, normal questions uh, we have. Their motions until after we've had the testimony today and we'll address them tonight before we leave. 
Uh, that'd be my plan, because how much time we have left. Uh, and just for the record, you are preserving all matters of uh, legal issues relating to the accounts uh, for a later time without any prejudice. And I, and I just want to make sure that it's clear on the record that we're not waiving our bring those motions which are typically brought at the end of the conclusion of the plaintiff's case by starting the defense case. I think I made it clear that you're without prejudice in that respect. Thank you. All right. Bring in the panel. Okay, folks, take your seats. Uh, Mr. Jacobson has rested his case, which means all the evidence that he uh, requires you to consider has been presented. We now uh, commence with the defense case. Um, Mr. Kessler, you can call your first witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The defense will call Zachary Dieterle to the stand. Sir, Mr. Sir, if you'll stand here. Face Madam Clerk, where are you right here this morning? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give over the truth, the whole truth, and the whole truth? I do. Please proceed up to the witness stand. Good morning, Mr. Dieterle. Good morning, Mr. Kessler. Can you tell the jury your name, please? My name is Zachary Dieterle. And Mr. Dieterle, where were you born? Sarasota, Florida. And where did you grow up? Nokomis, Florida. And where did you graduate high school? Pine View School. And is that located here in Sarasota? Yeah, it's located in Osprey. Uh, did you engage in any extracurricular activities while you were in high school? Yeah, I was a rower. And did you have any animals while you were growing up? A couple. Uh, what kind of animals did you have? As a little kid, um, we had a Cocker Spaniel mix, who was more mixed than Cocker Spaniel. Um, then when Winston passed, we went for a few years without a pet, and uh, we adopted Kara, who was a little 11 pound. We'll call her a super mutt. She was everything. Um, then she went along with her for a few years. Um, my parents adopted Molly, who was a schnoodle. Um, and did your uh, grandfather, D. Dieterle, have any animals? Yeah, he had a large uh, yellow lab named Mac. And how, how often would you see Mac? Once a week, at least. And did you have friends and family that had dogs while you were growing up? Yeah, it seems like everyone had a dog. Did you go to college? Uh, yes, sir. Where did you go? Uh, the Florida State University. Uh, did you graduate with any degrees? Yes, sir. Uh, criminology and criminal justice, bachelor of science, and I have a minor in entrepreneurship. In what year did you graduate college? 2014. When you were in college, uh, were you involved in any clubs or extracurricular activities? Uh, yeah, I was a member of the uh, RAFSU. And what type of club is that? It's a competition shooting club. And what are some of the stuff that, or some of the firearms that you would shoot at the club? Uh, we would shoot uh, semi-automatic pistols at steel plates, timed. And how often would you shoot firearms there with the club? There was a point I was shooting about three times a week. And uh, as a member of that club, did you receive any additional firearm training? Uh, yeah, right about the time I got my concealed carry permit when I turned 21, uh, the uh, range we shot out of was run by Leon County Sheriff's deputies. 
and one of the gentlemen who's actually a fish and wildlife officer was offering a advanced safety course for concealed carriers. And, and, and did you take that course? I participated in that, yes. And on, when you graduated college in 2014, what day of the week did you graduate? It was on a Saturday. And what did you do two days later on a Monday? Went to work. Where at? My father's company. And is that located here in Venice? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, when you were attending Florida State University, were you around animals? A lot, yes. Uh, who, uh, you were around a lot of animals. What kind of animals were you around? Dogs, cats, uh, someone I knew had a prairie dog. Um, a little bit of everything you see in college. And did your friends have any dogs? Yes. Did they have any particular type of dog? A lot of pit mixes. Did you also have any family members that lived in Tallahassee at the time you were attending university? Yes, I had a, she, we call her a cousin. Um, she's not actual blood, but it's, it's a cousin, it's family. And what type of animal did she have? She had a lab pit mix named Jasmine. And how often would you interact with Jasmine? She'd go out of town once a month or so, and I'd go over, feed the dog, walk the dog, hang out with the dog, just so she wasn't lonely. And uh, did you ever live with anybody that had animals? Yeah, my roommate's senior year had a pit boxer mix. And how long did you live with him for? Two full semesters and a little bit of the summer. Okay. Uh, did you have any girlfriends while you were in college? Uh, yes, uh, and she had a pit bull as well. And how long uh, were you around that pit bull for? We'll say six months we dated. And how often during that six months? I was there every day. So you're familiar with what we we're calling here today's pit bulls, correct? Yes. And are you familiar with what they look like? Yes. During your time at Florida State University, did you ever have any bad experiences with the pit bulls that you were around? None. When you would go over to spend time with Jasmine, uh, would anything happen when you would go over there? Well, when you open the door in a darkened apartment, a, a dog is actually going to sort of growl a little bit wonder who you are, but you know, as soon as you hit the light, they say, Jasmine, stop that. You know who I am. What she would she do? Immediately turn into a wiggly mess. <laughs> What's your current occupation? I'm a machinist and metal fabricator. And how long have you been engaged in that occupation for? The Monday after I graduated college. Okay. Do you know Mr. Jacobson? Yes. How do you know Mr. Jacobson? He was a travel and drinking buddy of my grandfather's. Okay. Uh, did you ever spend any amount of time with Mr. Jacobson? Him personally, no. I've been in the same room as him, but I've never hung out. I don't know him that well. Prior to the incident in November of 2016, had you ever engaged in any conversations with Mr. Jacobson? Other than, hi, how are you? No, never a direct to a point conversation. Prior to November of 2016, uh, had you ever seen Mr. Jacobson with his dog Candy that you know of? I had not. And prior to November of 2016, was there ever a time that you yourself interacted with the dog Candy that you know of? I had never met that dog before. Uh, I wanna to turn to the incident that occurred on November 18th, 2016. Uh, on the date of the incident, how old were you? I was 24. And the incident, where did it occur? Uh, 220 Luella Lane, which is my family's property that we've had my entire life. I grew up out there. Are you familiar with that property? Intimately. Let me go ahead and pull up. Exhibit 35, please. This is a survey of the property located at 220 Luella Lane. Are you familiar with that survey? I am. So uh, go ahead and describe this property for the jury. Okay, so it's a 
roughly 11 acres on Roberts and Lions Bay. Um, heavily wooded. There's only one small house on there. There's shell paths interlaced throughout it. Uh, it's incredibly vegetated and lush. And when this incident happened, it was pre-Hurricane Irma. So we still had a lot of brush and foliage still hanging. So was the property heavily wooded? Very much so. And was the property dense with vegetation? Yes. And how often would you visit the property prior to the incident? Be over there a couple times a week and sometimes spend weekends over there at the cabin. And what was the purpose of visiting the property? Well, it, like I say, it's lushly vegetated, it's gorgeous. It looks like a park and we had sometimes had problems with people coming on. Uh, oftentimes they just wanted to look around. We, we had also found evidence of partying, camp, campfire remnants and beer bottles and such. So just walk around so you know, people would see headlights shining through the trees and see people moving around the property so it didn't look necessarily uninhabited. On the date of the incident, what time of the day did you arrive at the property? Early evening, late afternoon, early evening. And what were you doing at the property that day? I was waiting. Waiting for who? Uh, my ex was coming up from her house. Uh, we were gonna park her car at the lot, get in mine, and drive to the airport to pick up one of my family members. And why were you driving to the airport to pick up one of your family members? My mother had had uh, knee surgery that morning, and she was not reacting well to the pain pills. So my dad was supposed to be the one to drive up and do the pickup at the airport, but he was staying with his wife. So he said, guess what? You get to drive to the airport. <laughs> so ultimately, you were chosen to go to the airport to pick up the family member? I was voluntold, yes. And, and when was it decided that you would pick up that family member? Earlier, uh, probably 10 to 12 o'clock. That same day? That same day, yes, sir. So before 10 or 12 o'clock on the date of the incident, before that time, you didn't think that you were going to go to the property? I, no, I did not. Let's talk about when you arrived at the property. Um, when you enter into the property, uh, how do you enter into the property? There's a large wood gate. That you got a punch code in, opens up, uh, and you can either go left and that will take you to the boathouse on the property where the small boat hangs. Uh, you can sort of go left and then right, and that goes down towards the lower part. There's sort of two elevations on the land, and that you sort of drive down. It's almost a hill, almost. Um, and if you, oh, sorry. I and if you go right immediately, um, it takes you to the cabin. I went right. That's where I usually park my vehicle. Okay, so on the day of the incident, you drive through the wooden gate, and you parked your vehicle, correct? Right. Uh, when you uh, arrived at the property and parked your vehicle, did you uh, see any vehicles at the property? Immediately, no. Okay, at what point in time, uh, well, let me ask you this, did you ever come to find or discover that there was a vehicle at the property? Sometimes, yes, sometimes you'd see the maintenance crew there. I'm talking about the date of the incident. Of the date, no. Okay. Uh, at, at, at any point in time, did you realize that there was a vehicle on the property at the date of the incident? Yeah, after I parked my, parked my vehicle, gotten out, I think I went, and went in and used the restroom in the cabin and sort of saw through the trees a truck parked down by the first T-Doc. Okay. And if we can blow up the survey, uh, the second page, we'll turn to the second page. Actually, let's go back to page one. I apologize. Uh, can we zoom in on the docks? And when you're referencing the T dock, which dock are you referencing on that photo? I'm right at the top one, the northmost one. Well, I don't have annotation here, but the northernmost one. Your Honor, would it be possible for it? Thank you. Yes, that one. Okay. Uh, did you expect there to be anyone at the property when you arrived? No. It wasn't uncommon to see people there, but I didn't expect anyone. 
Your Honor, if we can uh, switch back uh, to the monitor. I know you turned annotation on, but I think we have to switch back. And at what point was it that you recognized or that you realized there was a vehicle on the property? After I'd come out of the house, I looked down sort of through the trees and brush and vines and saw a pickup truck parked down by that, dock, that first dock. And did you recognize the vehicle? Initially, no. Uh, was there a point in time when you recognized the vehicle? Yeah, I walked, you walked down and around. You sort of have to take a roundabout way to get there because of a large, it's, it's a swamp. Basically, we've never gotten the drainage right in that area, so you can't walk through it. Okay. And at what point did you recognize whose vehicle it was? As I turned the corner, I saw Island Building Company on the side of the truck, so yeah. I knew that was Mr. Jacobson's. So you knew that to be Mr. Jacobson's company? Yes. You know, this would be very helpful for... Um, the witness's testimony, the annotation is still not on the screen. I think when we flipped it over, it got rid of the exhibit for some reason. You want the annotations on? Correct, Your Honor. And then it goes to the uh, blurry screen. If you wouldn't mind, Your Honor. Uh, we're trying to do annotations on uh, one of his, when we hit it, uh, it takes off the, the image. Being operated from the laptop. He's going to a closet. <laughs> I hope that's a good sign. <laughs> This may take a few minutes. Let's let the jury. 
Yeah. 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 Yes.
<laughs> I have to have my granddaughter do my PowerPoint, so I'm really technologically phobic. We got everybody? All right. Be seated. Let's bring the panel back. Folks well, coming back in from break, please make sure your cell phones are turned off. Mr. D. Lee, uh, if you could move the microphone a little closer to you. All right, right there. Yeah, you'll feel like it's in your face, which it probably is, but it'll help us. All right. All right, folks, you be seated. We think we have the technology problem solved. Mr. Kessler, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Gigli, you have in front of you uh, the survey in this case of the property. Uh, where was Mr. Jacobson's vehicle located on that survey? Roughly about there. And how was Mr. Jacobson's vehicle parked? Uh, tail, uh, tailgate towards the water. So by the water, I mean like over here. Okay. And did you see Mr. Jacobson? Uh, yes, he was walking down towards the dock. And did you do anything once you realized it was Mr. Jacobson? I called out to him. I said, hey, Rod, I, you know, I had no interest in sneaking up on the guy. And so why did you announce yourself to him? Didn't want to scare him when I walked up behind him. And did Mr. Jacobson respond? He did sort of a half turn over his shoulder and sort of stared, I guess, I think he was processing. And how far away from you was Mr. Jacobson at this point? 60 to 100 feet, I'm, I'm not sure. Should I draw it? Sure, if you could just do a little circle where Mr. Jacobson was at that point. About there. Okay. And did you continue to walk Mr. Jacob, walk towards Mr. Jacobson at this point? Uh, yeah, I continued to walk uh, sort of along the length of his truck. And why did you continue walking towards Mr. Jacobson? I was gonna go say hello. It's, it would be sort of impolite and maybe a little weird to just sort of stare and walk away. And at this point, where were you in relation to Mr. Jacobson's truck? Right beside it, sort of moving along the length of it. It's a large three-quarter ton pickup, so it takes a minute to get down the length of it. Okay. Uh, is there a pump house located on the property? Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's labeled as wood shed on this because it's a wood shed, but it holds all the irrigation equipment for the property. Okay, so if I reference pump house, uh, that's what is the wood shed that's shown on the survey? Yes, sir. And you'll know what I'm talking about? Yes. And after you started continuing walking towards Mr. Jacobson, what happened next? I heard sort of a crash come from behind the pump house, sort of like bushes rattling, bushes shaking. Mm -hmm. And what did you see? I turned around to see because it's not a usual noise you hear on that property. It's pretty quiet out there. Um, turned around, saw a large pit bull charging around the pump house. And around the pump house, is there dense vegetation around the pump house? There's sort of low bushes, like right up to the edge of it, but if the dog was outside of those, there's also, you can sort of see on this map, like right in here, those are palmetto thickets. Okay, and are they around the pump house? Yes, they're towards the back of it. And prior to this, did you know that there was a dog on the property? I did not. And how far away from you, uh, how far away from the pump house were you when you first saw the dog? 
30, 40 feet. And was the dog approaching you? Uh, yes, very rapidly. And was the uh, dog unleashed? Uh, it was completely unleashed. And was the dog barking at you? No, it was sort of snarling. And can you uh, tell the jury what you mean by snarling? I, I described it in my deposition as it sounded like when like a ripstop canvas gives way finally and it's a loud tearing noise. Um, I think I've also described it to friends as who are more car guys types that it sounds like a large motor without a muffler on it, just loud, deep. So you didn't hear it so much as feel it. And was it loud? Very. And was the dog doing anything else? It was running low to the ground, snarling, um, sort of head tucked, and had sort of a razor crest down the, the hair was raised down the center of its back and head. So its hair was raised down the center of the back and the head? Yes. Uh, did the dog coming out unexpectedly scare you? Yes, I, I was certainly not expecting that walking around the property. Did the dog's loud snarl scare you? Yes. Did the dog's mannerism scare you? Yes, I really had not seen anything like that in person before. And how much time elapsed between you saying, hey, Rod, and announcing yourself to Mr. Jacobson uh, and the dog coming out of the bushes by the pump house? Say five to 10 seconds. And what did you do in response to the dog snarling and running at you? I immediately turned to face it. I didn't want to turn my back on what I was starting to perceive as a threat and sort of yelled at it, sort of, hey dog, hey dog. It was nonsensical, yes, but didn't know what else to do at the time. And did it keep coming at you? Yes. Uh, can you tell the jury if you yelled out to Mr. Jacobson? Uh, not, in, not at that point necessarily. Um, when it got a little closer, I started yelling, Rod, get your dog, Rod, get your dog. And can you tell the jury if Mr. Jacobson said anything to you at that time? Nothing. It was absolute silence from behind me. Can you tell the jury if Mr. Jacobson said anything to the dog at that time? Nothing. No sit, no stay, nothing. Can you tell the jury if Mr. Jacobson did anything to help you at this time? Not that I saw. No, he did not. Didn't see anything. Didn't hear anything. How close did the dog get to you initially? First time, within four feet. And did you do anything when it got close to you? Yeah, the only reason I think it didn't get closer is because I kicked dirt and a shell at it. It's the paths there are like that crushed shell mixture that they sort of sell by the dump truck load. That's what they're all lined with. So I kicked that at it so it had rocks and dirt flying at it. So it stopped and went back out, went away from me. Uh, were you wearing shoes on the date of the incident? Uh, yes, sir. I was in a very old pair of boat shoes. And why did you kick dirt at the dog? It seemed really unhappy with me. I don't know why. It seemed aggressive. And I wanted to go back to the palm thicket from where it came from and leave me alone so I could get out of there. Can you tell the jury what the dog was doing while you were kicking at it? Kicking dirt at it? It was continuous snarl, and as it got in a little closer, it sort of snapped its jaw at me. It sort of got it. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen. It was, uh, was it continuing its loud snarl? Yes. And did it continue to snap its jaws? Only when it was in close at me. It wasn't running around, snap, snap, snapping. But when it would get close you know, to me, it would sort of try to, I don't know if it was trying to grab me or what, but it would pop his jaws at me. And what did the dog do after you kicked dirt at it to scare it away? Sort of went out and made a, it's not a loop, because it, it's, that would sort of sound like it's round, but it sort of went out and back, like it was regrouping. Okay, so using the color blue, at this point in time on the screen, go ahead and just do a little dot where you were standing at that point. I was actually right there. Okay. And when you say that the dog made a loop, uh, can you annotate on the screen the direction that the dog went and made the loop? It sort of came out and back. Okay. And when the dog moved out toward the pump house, uh, why didn't you try to retreat? 
because I really didn't have anywhere to go. It's actually a fairly narrow path between the truck and the pump house and the bushes there. And it was, the property was a lot more overgrown at that time uh, than when this survey was made. Uh, it was pre-Hurricane Irma, so it was overgrown. We had a lot of deadfall when that storm came through, so we cleaned out a lot. And what did you, uh, 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 did the dog come back at you after it made the first loop? Yeah, it came, so I sort of drew it there. It came, at, went back and came back in at me. And did the dog ever stop running? No, never stopped moving. Was it still snarling when it came back at you? Yes. And as the snarl was continuing, were you growing more fearful? Yes. Uh, was the dog still quickly running at you? Yes, it was. And as the pit bull was continuing to quickly run at you, were you growing more uh, fearful? Yes, I wasn't sure why it was so, so intent on me. Was the dog still snapping its jaws? When it got in closer, yes. And as the dog was continuing to snap its jaws, were you growing more fearful? Absolutely. Uh, after this first loop, do you know where Mr. Jacobson was at this point? I lost track of him. I was focusing on the dog trying to, to, at this point, I was pretty convinced it was trying to bite me. So I was purely focused on that. I didn't hear him, didn't hear anything from him. And can you tell the jury if Mr. Jacobson said anything to you at this point? He said nothing. And can you tell the jury if Mr. Jacobson said anything to his dog at this point? I heard no commands, nothing. And did you observe Mr. Jacobson doing anything to get his dog under control at this point? I didn't observe Mr. Jacobson, period. He was somewhere behind me. And did Mr. Jacobson do anything to help you at this point? He did nothing. Did you say anything to Mr. Jacobson at this point? At this point, I was screaming, Rod, get your dog, Rod, get your dog, Rod, get your dog. I was, I mean, I yelled myself hoarse. I couldn't, I could hardly talk the next day. And can you tell the jury what you were feeling at this point in time? Scared. This is the only time I had ever had an animal react to me that way. I mean, yeah, I'm 24 years old at the time, and grew up around dogs, never had that issue. It's, it, was, it was strange. It was totally alien. And after the first loop, how close did the dog get to you? It got close enough where I was able to make contact with it when I kicked it. I kicked it in the side of the head as it came in at me. So when it made the first loop, when it came back, you kicked it in the head? It made a dash at me, yes, and I sort of moved to the side and kicked at it, and I think I got it on the side of the head or in the neck. And how did the dog respond to the kick? Well, it wasn't hurt because, let's face it, I'm not that big of a guy, and it's a pit bull. They're tough. Um, but it, went, it, it was surprised, I think, that I had done something like that. Did the dog back off away from you at that point? Yeah, it moved off again in a pretty good clip and sort of came back out and around again. Can you show the jury by annotating uh, what you mean by it went out and came back again? Well, it came sort of out like that. I'm maybe not quite out that far, but then it came in and worked in along that palm thicket there and back. And by that time, I had moved a little bit trying to sort of get clear of the truck and open ground so I had open sight lines. And I was about in there facing outwards, face this is south. At that point in time was the truck behind you? The truck was to my left shoulder. And as the dog was going out making the second loop back, mm -hmm. uh, did you do anything to try to get away from the dog? while well, I was yelling for Mr. Jacobson to get your dog, get your dog, I really couldn't get away because the dog controlled everywhere to the south. If I had tried to get between the truck, I would have been pinned between trucks and bu the bushes. On the driver's side of the truck, it's a slippery mess that's part of the drainage to that swampy area that's annotated on the survey. 
I really had nowhere to go. And if I had gone out to the dock, I'd have been pinned out at the end of the dock. And when it came back on the second loop, uh, it came back at you, correct? Yeah, loop. I think we're on the third loop now. Well, this, we're still on the second loop. All I'm right. talking about the second one. So it came back at you again. Right. Uh, did it ever stop running? No, it never stopped moving. And at this time, was the pit bull still snarling at you? Yes, it was. And as the snarl was continuing, were you growing more fearful? Yeah, nothing I was doing was working. And was the dog still quickly running at you? Yes. And as the dog was continuing to quickly run at you, were you growing more fearful? Yes. Was the dog still snapping its jaws at this time? When it would get close to me, yes, it would. And as the dog was continuing to snap its jaws, were you growing more fearful? Yes. At this point, uh, do you know where Mr. Jacobson was? I have no idea. Uh, at this point, did Mr. Jacobson say anything to you? He didn't say a thing. Uh, can you tell the jury if Mr. Jacobson said anything to his dog at this point? Hey, no commands, nothing. And can you tell the jury if Mr. Jacobson did anything to try to get his dog under control at this point? He did absolutely nothing. Uh, can you tell the jury if Mr. Jacobson did anything to help you at this point? No help whatsoever. Did Mr. Jacobson uh, do anything that you could observe? He was, I think he was hiding behind me. I didn't see him, he was not in my line of sight. I couldn't see any, any part of him. Nothing out of my periphery, nothing. And at this point in time, were you still yelling? Yes. And to whom were you yelling? At this point, I probably get your, intermittently get your dog, get your dog, and partially just trying to make noise and look big, sound big, to maybe dissuade that dog to go away. And the dog get close to you again? Yes, on this third time it got in and it didn't make a full run at me. It sort of stopped short and worked in and moved out. And Work can, can you tell the jury what you mean by worked in and worked out? It would approach me and sort of pop its jaws at me and then I would give ground to get away, sort of back up just a little bit and then as it was coming back on its haunches, I'd jump at it to try to get ground back and just make it think I was bigger than I was, that it didn't maybe want to have this, you know, today. Uh, and that went back and forth a couple times. It was working in on me. It was looking for an opening. It was looking for if I set a foot wrong, slipped, fell, I think. So. And how close was the dog getting to you each time that it would come in at you? Inches. And can you tell the jury what you were feeling at this point? Terror. I, nothing I was doing was working. I tried, tried everything. I worked up every little idea that I could think of in the moment. I mean, you, you think you yell, you scream, you kick dirt or something. You actually kick it, it'll go away. But it didn't. You would think if the owner was right there, you'd start to hear sit, stay, candy, no. I didn't. And as the dog was coming in, in going back out, did you try walking backwards? As far as I could. Um, as soon as you get off that path, um, like I said, there's, uh, it's a muddy, swampy mess. It's, I mean, I've fallen over in it before. It's sort of how I'm pretty familiar with the property. I've you know, gone the whole bonfire covered in mud because I slipped and fell there. Um, in, in using the purple color, can you identify the wet, muddy area that you're describing for the jury? And was it muddy on the date of the incident? Yeah, it was pretty bad. I think the irrigation had run the night before. So if any runoff from that, it makes its way down that driver's side of the truck along the side of the path. It's like sort of a slow moving creek almost and it ends up there in that low spot. Was there a point in time when you stopped walking backwards? Yeah, I had given too much ground um, when it had come at me. So I was nowhere to go. Is that because you had the muddy area behind you? Correct. And when you stopped walking backwards, did the dog do anything? It, it, it tensed. It tensed, it got even lower than it was, and it, uh, it was reading me. It was, it, uh, and I just got this weird feeling that, all right, this is it, here we go. Now this is where I'm gonna get hurt. And tell the jury what you were feeling at this point. 
fear and sort of resigned to the fact that I was about to deal with an injury. Did there come a point in time where you felt there was nothing more you could do? Absolutely, then. Um, I reached for my concealed pistol, um, as I've been taught. Um, I keep it in a pocket holster. Um, it's got like sort of a sticky substance on the outside of it to hold the holster pouch in your pocket so it doesn't come out with the firearm. And brought the revolver out and sort of anchored in, brought it down low into my hip because the dog was so close and fired. You said that the firearm you had was a revolver? Uh, yeah, it's a 38 Special uh, Smith & Wesson J-Frame, so five-shot revolver, small for concealment. And how many times did you shoot for, or shoot? Uh, three times total. And can you explain to the jury uh, why you shot from your hip? Because if I had, A, taken the time to extend and aim down the barrel of the sights, the dog was that close, I wouldn't have had time. And B, uh, it was so close, I would have been over its backside. I would have been aiming over it. Uh, did you hit the dog on the first shot? I didn't. And did the dog run away after hearing the first shot? It did not, and I was honestly surprised by that. It's can you, can you tell the jury what the dog did after the first shot? It kept coming. And I fired again. F I didn't mean to interrupt you. After the first shot, was the dog still baring its teeth at you? Yes, it went snapping and, and continuing to snarl. And did Mr. Jacobson, did you observe Mr. Jacobson do anything after the first shot? I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything from him. And then you said there was a second shot, right? Correct. Uh, did you hit the dog on the second shot? I did not. Uh, did the dog run away after hearing the second shot? Unfortunately, no. And can you tell the jury what the dog did after the second shot? It pressed its attack. It came and it kept coming. At this point in time, was the dog still baring its teeth? Yes, and it was about on top of me. Uh, can you tell the jury if Mr. Jacobson did anything after you fired the second shot? I heard nothing. I heard, I didn't hear anything. No, no sit, no stay, no, 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 no cry of anger, nothing. Did you shoot a third time? I shot a third time. And did you hit the dog with the third shot? I did. And how do you know that you hit the dog with the third shot? It made a sort of a yip and rapidly moved away from me, it planted its front paws and turned around and ran. At this time, where were you positioned uh, on the survey? I think I sort of right around there because you know, you get any further, you're into the mess. And the dog ran out and away from me, out and around, and his boat was on that side. Okay. And after you shot the third shot, uh, do you know uh, where Mr. Jacobson was at that point? Well, all of a sudden he appeared right behind me and I, he said, did you just shoot my dog? Uh, was Mr. Jacobson ever in your line of sight as you fired the gun? He was never in my line of sight. Can you tell the jury if you ever aimed your gun at Mr. Jacobson? I never aimed my gun, gun at him, ever. Can you tell the jury if you ever fired your gun at Mr. Jacobson? No, I never fired it at him. Uh, prior to you shooting the dog, can you tell the, G the jury if Mr. Jacobson tried to help you in any, at any time prior to shooting the dog? He did nothing. Zach, did you ever shoot the dog while it was running away? No. You said you shot three times, correct? Correct. How do you know you shot three times? A few days later, um, when I sort of settled down and was ready to sort of more calm, I went to reload the firearm and I found three expended cases in the cylinder. Revolver retains its shells. It doesn't eject them like a semi-automatic. So they were still there. So I found three rounds expended and two not, two live ammo. Uh, 
I just want to be clear for members of the jury who may not be familiar with firearms. You said it was a five shot revolver that you had? Correct. And you said there were two rounds left when you went to reload it? Two live rounds left, yes. And can you explain to the jury uh, why shell casings for the spent rounds wouldn't have come out of a revolver? So a revolver works by, it's, there's a cylinder that revolves as you pull the trigger. There's like a clockwork mechanism inside. So as you pull, it works this around and rotates a new round into place in front of the barrel. So it just continually spins. So you, you have to manually pull out the spent shell casings, what hold, what hold the bullets and powder, to reload new rounds. So it retains. It's not like where you see in the movies where guy bang, 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 and you see brass flying out of the side of the, of the weapon. It's not like that. It retains the spent shell casings. Okay. If I can go ahead and get Exhibit 3 pulled up, the third page of Exhibit 3. And if I can get the last two paragraphs blown up, please. Zach, I'm gonna turn your attention to the uh, Sheriff's Office police report um, from Deputy Achille. Uh, in the report, Deputy Achille uh, stated that you had told him that you shot so fast and the second two shots were a reaction. Uh, can you tell the jury why you may have told the deputy something different than what you're testifying to here today? Time brought clarity on the issue. Um, they talked to me the day after it had happened. I hadn't slept that night. I was, well, I was shaken up. I hadn't eaten. I had zero appetite. I suspect I was probably dehydrated. I was. I curled up into a ball. And I was. It was awful. I mean, I had never killed an animal before this. I hope to never again. Um, I was a little. I was shook. I was. It was terrible. I didn't want this to happen. I didn't go there with the idea that this would even happen, it was, it was terrible. It was completely awful. I'm, it's, it's, it's the long and short of it. I was shook up when those police officers, you met Deputy Achille, he was the deputy and he's sergeant now, and his co-worker, I guess, came and sat at my kitchen table that I had grown up at and were asking me about a shooting. It was, with time, uh, got some rest, got some food in me, and sort of rehashed, rehashed, rehashed on the, on what had happened, and that brought, okay, this is how it went. In all the actions that you took, that you described to the jury here today, were those actions taken solely to repel the dog from attacking you? So I would have been so happy if it had been, if it had got, ran away after the first shot that missed it. Uh, did you ever do anything during the course of this incident to? inflict harm or fear in Mr. Jacobson? I know. After the incident occurred, after you had to shoot the dog and it ran down uh, to the dock, uh, did Mr. Jacobson say anything to you after the incident? He said, well, hey, we're immediately left, did you just shoot my dog? And it's in the record and he testified that I said, well, you're damn right I did. I did say that. I was scared. I was sh shook up. I had no idea what had just happened. I believe I called him an idiot for having the pit bull unleashed on our property. Um, and, why did, and we can take down exhibit three, thank you. Uh, and why did you say that to Mr. Jacobson? Because the dog had run out of the bushes at me on property that I grew up on. I felt safe out there. That was, you know, Mr. Timpanic loves the phrase happy place. It was my happy place. I, I, it was, it's, it's, it's an amazing piece of property. And I had spent a lot of time out there. It was a lot of stress relief out there, just sit and enjoy. And it had been, it, it had been ruined. It, it, I went there with the intention of having a nice evening, walk around the property and go up and pick up a family member and have a nice dinner. And here I was getting attacked and, you know, I'm aware of what the, there's legal ramifications when you discharge a firearm, so. In, in were you, um, were you upset at that point because the dog was not leashed? Yes. 
We're not here today if that dog had been on a leash. And what is the last thing that Mr. Jacobson said to you? You're gonna be in big trouble if this dog dies. And he like, pointed at me and was threatening. You're gonna be in big trouble if this dog dies. And did you say anything back to Mr. Jacobson in response? No, uh, there's nothing to say. And at this point, what did Mr. Jacobson do? He put the dog in his truck, got in, and I mean, he did not eloquent for his, he peeled out. He, he stepped on the gas as hard as he could and sped out of the property. So he quickly left the property? Yes. When Mr. Jacobson left the property, did you have occasion to observe his truck leaving the property? I did. As you observed his truck leaving the property, did you uh, see any damage to his truck? I didn't. Did you ever shoot at the truck? Absolutely not. Did you ever shoot the truck? No. Uh, did you ever shoot in the direction of the truck? No. You heard Mr. Jacobson testify during his testimony that uh, the dog was underneath his truck when you shot it. Is that the case? It was not. It was in the bushes behind that pump house. Did you believe at the time of shooting the dog that you had to use deadly force against the dog? I had run out of every other option that I had, so yes. Were you fearful that the dog was going to inflict harm on you? I was. And at that point in time when you shot the dog, did you believe that you had done everything that you could to have repelled the, ta the attack other than shooting? Absolutely. I'd done absolutely everything. And did you believe that the only way to prevent you from getting hurt was by shooting the dog? Yes. Did you want to shoot the dog? Lord, no. Did Absolutely you want, not. Did you I, want to cause harm to the dog? Absolutely not. Can you describe for the jury how you felt after the incident occurred? I was shaking. I was terrified. I was, uh, I had a massive adrenaline dump. I was, I mean, I'd never had something like that happen before. I mean, I've been in a few car wrecks before, but nothing like that. Nothing that, that sheer terror, fight or flight that was going through me right then. And after the incident occurred, can you tell the jury what you did? I immediately, I called my ex and said, you don't need to come up here, something happened, go home. And I called my father and told him what had happened on the property. He immediately told me, or get back here. So I drove back to their house. It's like five minutes away. So mm -hmm. after, after the incident occurred, you called your dad and you went back to your house? Correct. And what did you, can you tell the jury what you did when you got home? Uh, they he sat me down at the kitchen table and said, well, okay, what happened? And went through what I just said and well, basically they tried to get liquid in me. Um, they had me a cup, and it was a good thing it was a turvis because I was shaking so bad I would have spilled. Um, after that, we went through that. I sat, tried to gather thoughts for a minute, and we still had someone coming into the airport. So my father um, said, all right, you're coming with me. And we got in, the, got in the truck and went up and picked my family member up. And when you arrived at your house and you were seated at the table, can you describe to the jury uh, what you were feeling at this point? Everything. I was, it was fear, sadness, a little bit of anger at what had happened. Was, I, was, I was shaking. I was jittery. I could, I could barely spit sentences out. I mean, I know I'm a, probably a stuttering mess up here. Sorry, Richard. <laughs> but it was, it was bad. I had had every bit of adrenaline dump into my system, and I was coming down from it. And who did you tell about the incident? Initially, my family. Okay. And then I believe you testified that at that point in time, your father said, come on, let's go. We have to go to the airport. Correct. Uh, did you and your father go to the airport to pick up the family member? We did. Who drove? My dad. I was in no shape. And what do you, can you tell the jury what you mean by you were in no shape to drive? I was still shaking. I was still messed up. I was bad. Uh, I mean, I won't say I wasn't seen straight or anything like that, but I was not, it would have been unsafe for me to get behind the wheel. And the original plan was for you to go to the airport to pick up the family member, correct? Correct. Do you have your concealed weapons permit? I do. 
How long have you had your concealed weapons permit? Since right after I turned 21, which is legal age to get it. And prior to obtaining your concealed weapons permit, did you take any classes? Uh, state of Florida requires you take, I forget how many hours it is, but requires that you take a law and proficiency class for to get your concealed carry permit to even qualify you to take the background check. And did you take that? Uh, yes, I passed the background check from F uh, Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And did you ever uh, take any extended instruction in how to use a firearm? Uh, yes, as I was getting the permit, um, they were offering the advanced concealed carry class through the through RAFSU, through the range that we shot out of. Uh, I figured, you know, if you're going to carry this thing, you might as well know how to use it properly, use it safely, so you're not a threat to yourself or society. And is it... Do you routinely carry a concealed firearm? Pretty much wherever I go, yes. And is that for safety reasons? Safety reasons, yes. Uh, other than the dog in this incident, have you ever shot any other animals? No, sir. Have you ever hunted animals? No. Uh, have you ever shot any people? N no. Uh, have you ever threatened to shoot someone? Absolutely not. Uh, have you ever threatened to shoot another animal either before or after this incident? I have not. And uh, Mr. Dealey, I, uh, from your testimony, I take that this was a, a traumatic event for you. It was incredibly traumatic. Uh, can you tell the jury how this incident has affected you? I mean, on the emotional, I feel free, I feel absolutely terrible that a dog had to die that day. I didn't want that to happen. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an animal. I, I like animals. I, you know, I don't even have a particular problem with pit bulls. Uh, I just that one. I had never had an animal treat me like that before. I mean, even you walk into a house and the animal's new and it's curious, little, you know, maybe a little standoffish or that. You talk sweet to it and. Maybe try to give it, bribe it with a milk bone and make friends. But there was none of that with this, and I don't know why for the life of me. Thank you, Mr. Dieter. Your Honor, that's all the questions I have at this time. Cross, Your Honor. All right. Let's be clear for the record. You shot and killed Candy the dog, correct? I did. And you just stated that you felt te terrible about it, correct? I did. Yet you felt so terrible that immediately after the incident, you called Mr. Jacobson a fucking moron, correct? Yes, I did. You felt so te terrible, you called him a goddamn idiot, correct? Mr. Timpan, can you please lower your volume? Can we just have a conversation, please? Did you call him a goddamn moron, correct? I did. You felt so terrible immediately after shooting Candy the dog, you said, you goddamn right I did, correct? I did not say that. Did you say, you're damn right I did? Yes. You stated on direct that you're not that big of a guy, correct? 5'7". How much do you weigh, Mr. Dieterle? Oh, that's rude of you. But, but right now, about 220. And in 2016, how much approximately did you weigh? We were doing keto at the time, so I was about 190 pounds, I think. Candy the dog did not bite you, correct? Thankfully, yes. That's the truth. Candy the dog did not jump on you, correct? Thankfully not. Candy the dog didn't even get within two feet of you, correct? With the exception of when it, as you stated, when you kicked at her. On the third pass that it made in, it was getting within inches, and then I was giving ground to open the gap up between us. Okay. And Mr. Dieterle, you stated earlier that you... Can I pull, uh, can I have the survey pulled up with the annotations, please? Yeah, I don't have any problem 
pulling it up, but the issue is that if Mr. Timpanic is looking for the prior annotations, uh, given the technology, uh, we can't pull that up, but we did take a picture of it to send to IT. So if IT wanted to email me the picture. I don't picture, think he's wanting the annotations. Just, just the survey is fine. Uh, I, we have no problem pulling it up, Your Honor. This is, obviously this is <clears throat> your grandfather's property, correct? My family's. No. Who is, whose property does this belong to? It belongs to D. Dieterle, correct? You're wrong. It belongs to Spring Release, LLC, correct? Did you do your research, Mr. Dempanic? There's three officers of that. My father is one of them. My grandfather was one of them. He's since passed. And my aunt. Okay. I'll rephrase. Are none of those individuals you, Mr. Dieterle? None of those individuals are me. So would it be fair to say that it was your grandfather's property or your father's property or your aunt's property, correct? Yes, they owned it jointly. Okay. And you said earlier that Mr. Jacobson uh, was not paying attention to you whatsoever, correct? Well, I raised his attention when I said, hey, Rod. He was walking away from me, and then I made myself known. Mm -hmm. Okay. And could we zoom in a little bit for this? Or can I do that? Oh, no. Zoom in on the shell path, please, where uh, the... Could Mr. Dieterle, just can you real quickly just redraw the where the truck was, please? Roughly in there. Okay. And it's your testimony today that Candy took three passes at you, correct? Correct. And you stated you had no ability to retreat from the situation, correct? Correct. And it's also your testimony that Mr. Jacobson, by your own admission, was down by the dock, correct? Correct. And so tell me, Mr. Dieterle, you could have ran to the dock, correct? Yeah, but then I'm pinned at the end of the dock, and what do I do? Is it Mr. Wouldn't Mr. Jacobson be down by the dock? He was within sight of me. So, but that's not my question. By your own admission, he's walking towards the dock, correct? He had stopped and turned. Okay. So if you run towards him, that's towards the dock. You could have done that, correct? I didn't want to take my eyes off the threat. Okay. And, but also additionally, you could have turned around, correct? Turned around to where? towards the bush. Obviously you can see the waste area, which you, and that's perfectly understandable, but isn't that area right there you could have easily walked to the right of the waste area? No, that, like I said, that's the drainage to the waste area. It's very slippery and wet okay. as well. Okay. And you stated you fired three shots at Candy the dog, correct? Correct. You stated the first one didn't hit, correct? correct. That was correct. You stated the second bullet didn't hit, correct? That's correct. And you stated the third did hit, correct? Correct. So, from your supplement, would it be fair to say that one's memory becomes um, details that, oh, I'll strike that. Do you think over time people's memories get a little hazy, or would, correct? Over long periods, yes. Okay. But in a so, no, no, that's, that's enough. Your Honor, I'd ask that he be allowed to finish his answer to the question. Yeah, he can answer yes or no. Okay. And would it be fair to say one's memory one day after the incident would be stronger than it is five and a half years later, correct? Five and a half, yes. So, if I may bring up the supplement from the Sheriff's Office, same, paragra uh, same paragraph that was mentioned. Page three, and then the paragraph, uh, second to last paragraph, please. <coughs> Could you please read the first paragraph aloud, Mr. Dieterle? Uh, the suspect advised that the dog then ran away. He was not sure if he had hit the dog with any of the fired shots. When the suspect was asked if he shot at the dog as he ran away, the, the suspect stated, I shot so fast that the, se the second two shots were a reaction. I advise the suspect of this incident would be reviewed in detail further and that SSO would be in contact with them. 
So you're, you told law enforcement only one day after the incident, you weren't even sure if you hit Candy the dog, correct? One day, yes, after I had not slept that night, after I had not eaten for a long period of time. And as I was, uh, I'm gonna say I was dehydrated. And, but now, five and a half years later, you're able to say that you hit Candy the dog with three shots, correct? I believe or I- the third shot. I'm I believe sorry. I put that in my deposition, which was done more recently. Okay. And additionally, you stated, well, get to the second sentence. I shot so fast, the second two shots were reaction. Based, would it be fair to say that based on what we just heard, that's a direct contradiction to that statement, correct? You could say that, but as I have said, time brought clarity on the actual timeline of the events of the dog and how it had come at me and how I had fired. Okay, so that five and a half years later, you have clarity that you didn't have one day after it, correct? One day after, yes, but you're negating the uh, whole took my deposition. That was, you know, pretty close afterwards. So you're sort of twisting words on me, Mr. Timpanic. Okay. And Mr. Mr. Dieterle, was there a, so you never saw Rod Jacobson From, until after you had fired the shots? I saw him, announced myself, heard the dog, turned to face the dog, turned to face the threat, managed the threat until it ran away from me, and then he reappeared again behind me as if he was hiding behind me. Okay, and you said, Mr. Jacobson, are you familiar with the, not particularly candy, that Mr. Jacobson's wife and him would have a lot of animals? I knew that they were sort of, I mean, my grandfather used the term animal hoarders, probably unfair. Um, I knew they had a lot of dogs, cats, pigeons, whatever. Would it be fair to say animal protectors? Uh, I don't know. Withdrawn, Your Honor. So, Mr. Dieterle, your testimony is that you, you don't know for sure Rod Jacobson was behind you, correct? I have no idea where he was hiding at. And would it also be fair to say that when law enforcement, you were here when Deputy Ankeel testified, correct? I was here when Deputy Ankeel was here. Yes. And did, did you not hear that he could not eliminate that he was adjacent to you, as he stated, as Mr. Jacobson stated in his testimony, correct? Well, seeing as he wasn't there and it's a he said, he said situation, yes, that would make sense. Okay. Fair enough. Mr. Dieterle. When you finally heard Rod Jacobson say, did you just shoot my dog? How far away was he from you? I was on the edge of the shell path towards the south of it. I was still, I was in the grass just a little bit and he was on the shell path. So that path's five, six feet wide, wide enough to barely back that truck down. So, and I assume he was standing like dead in the middle of it. So three feet behind me. A few feet behind you? Yes. So your testimony is that the dog that you've heard all month that he loves so much, instead of going to help it, it stands by, he stands by and allows you to shoot him, correct? That's exactly what I'm saying. That's the okay. exact problem. Yet, I'd like to ask you about the firearm. Mr. Jacobson testified that immediately after the incident, you called him a fucking moron, a goddamn idiot, correct? I called him that for having that dog off leash on our land. And he also stated that you were waving your firearm at him, almost I, taunting him, correct? I would never do that. Really? And you would never, just like you would never call somebody a, a goddamn idiot after you just shot their dog? I never said I would never do that. Mr. Dieterle, your testimony includes that, and let me help summarize. 
the dog never bit you, correct? Fortunately, that's true. It wasn't, and you say there's a punch code to get onto the property, correct? Correct. And somebody who would come onto the property would need to be able to use that, correct? If you wanted to come in with a vehicle, yes. If you, you could come in by water as well. The gates don't have, or the docks don't have a gate on them. Or as we saw with the split rail fence, you could go through that. But since Mr. Jacobson had his vehicle there, he had to have used the punch code to get in, correct? Correct. correct. And that's something he would have had, correct? I, uh, yes. You said you were resigned to getting injury, correct? Correct. But you, and you were trying to get, by your own admission, you're trying to get Rod's attention, correct? Mm hmm. And yet, you didn't go towards Rod. I didn't know where he was. But didn't you state earlier you saw him walking towards the path, correct? Yes. And, and by your own admission, how many times have you been on the property before, prior to that incident? Thousands. So you would know exactly where he'd be heading, correct? Cause for speculation, Your Honor. I'll, I'll rephrase. You knew Mr. Jacobson docked his boat right at the end of the path, correct? Objection. Uh, improper foundation, proper predicate, and that's something that goes way above uh, direct. I'll uh, go ahead. Rephrase, please, or repeat, please. Sure. You knew Mr. Jacobson docked his boat at the end of that shell pack, correct? I knew that that is where he kept it. I don't know if it was there that day or not. Okay. Couldn't but, to. Okay. But you knew, would it be fair to say you knew that's where usually his boat was? Usually, yes. And you usually knew that, and would it be fair to say that the two instances, two types of situation, primary, that your Mr. Jacobson would be on the property to, would be either to be on his boat or working on your grandfather's property, correct? Objection calls for speculation. Overruled. I don't know Rod Jacobson, so I don't know what he would be doing. He could you, uh, all right, that's fine. You stated earlier that he was a vacationing buddy and a drinking buddy, correct? Correct. Now, well, that mischaracterizes the uh, witness's testimony, Your Honor, so I'm going to object to that question. It was the grandfather's drinking buddy and travel buddy. I think that was oh, yeah, I'll rephrase that. Rod Jacobson, by your own testimony, was your grandfather's vacation and drinking buddy, correct? That's correct. And you heard testimony from Mr. Jacobson that he was sometimes on the property and he did some, like, help around that property activities for your grandfather, correct? Yes. And you knew that he would, he'd been out on the property numerous times, correct? I was aware. And would it be fair to say that if he's walking down that, can I pull up that survey? Just so we can see. And zoomed in at the end of the shell path, please. That, you, you obviously see this photograph. Right. And you know if he's walking in that direction, he's very likely walking towards his boat, correct? That would make sense. And would it be make sense that considering you said you were what, 60 feet from him, correct? Give or take, yes. And you could have easily walked right to Mr. Jacobson where he was if to pos potentially help you. You're already calling out to him, correct? Yes, but I also didn't want to take my eyes off the dog that was running at me, snarling at me, so walk backwards? No, I, like you said, you're standing face to face. Like, uh, you draw the dot just so we can be able to, so you're face to face with the animal, correct? Correct, face And you turning this way to the right, which would make sense, you're not taking your eyes off the animal, correct? That would be wrong. If, you're, if you are Candy the dog, and I am you, and I turn right as the survey, I'm still being able to keep my eyes on you while still walking in the direction of the dog, Objection correct? calls for speculation. Oh, hold on, the witness connects. Dog was moving around. 
It was constantly move, moving, milling about, coming sort of from different directions. I didn't want to risk taking my full attention off of it. Okay, that's fair. And yet, you made no effort to try, since you're calling out to, why did you call out to Rod? The first time? Yes, I know, when did you get your dog off me? Why did you call out to Rod specifically? Because he was the only other person on the property. We don't have any witnesses to this incident, so. So you assumed that it was Rod's dog, correct? Yes. So that you knew that if you were able to, so would it be fair to say that you knowing that you could have got to Rod and Rod could have helped you out, correct? I can't outrun that dog to get to him in time. But you don't even need to outrun it, Mr. Dieterle. By the looks of it, it looks to be 20, 30 feet, correct? I don't know. I don't know the scale of it. You'd have to. You don't know the scale of a property you've been to thousands of times? I'm not good with distance, honestly. But you were good with distance when you said it came within two inches of you five and a half years later, correct? A little difference between 20 feet and two inches, Mr. Timpanic. Oh, good, yes. 20, yeah, it was 20 and 24 inches and 26 inches. Uh, clear, good clarification. So you're talking about, I'm not good with distances, yet during the stress of the situation with a vicious pit bull allegedly trying to come at you, you're able to judge that it's 24 inches, correct? I never said 24 inches. You never said that in your deposition that it got within 24 inches? So we can, obviously, we're going to do the deposition thing now. Sorry, are you narrating for yourself? Oh, no, we'll, we'll come back to you, Mr. Dieterle. Don't worry. I haven't forgotten about you. Yeah, we'll come back to this. i got plenty of time. And so that, that's where, to me, that's the strangest part, that you couldn't go anywhere, that you were pinned, because I, I understand your point about the waste area behind you, but immediately to your right is allegedly where you're claiming Mr. Jacobson is, correct? Correct, and I was backing slowly in that direction, watching the dog as it was circling around and trying to get at me. So Yelling for the owner, thinking that maybe he would find it within himself to approach. And, and tell the dog to sit. And tell okay, the dog to stay. and would it be fair to say that Mr. Jacobson did eventually approach? Yeah, after all was said and done with. Uh, but yet, you said, okay, during this whole thing, he walked up and he was right next to you, correct? Objection. This characterizes the witness's prior testimony. All right. Restate the question. You heard Mr. Jacobson say in, during his testimony that he was shoulder to shoulder with you, correct? That's what he said. He said a lot of things. Okay. And, but if he wasn't shoulder to shoulder with you, you've heard Mr. Jacobson's voice. How would he be able, how would you be able to hear him when he said, did you just shoot your dog, my dog, if he wasn't a three feet from you, Mr. Dieterle? Because he was right behind me. Right behind you or right next to you? I'm saying behind me. Okay, but wouldn't it be fair to say that he was only a few feet from you when he said that? Objection calls for speculation. Obviously the witness can't see anything that's behind him. So your testimony is, Mr. Dieterle, that a dog Mr. Jacobson loved more than life was his best friend, decided to stand there and watch you shoot his dog, correct? Yes. Immediately following the shooting, Mr. Jacobson went to his boat, correct? From what I can tell, yes. And you heard Dr. Ellis testify, correct? Yes. And Dr. Ellis testified that the bullet went in from one side and stayed in Candy the dog, correct? Yes. And would it be fair to say that that bullet had to go in, that dog had to be angled from a side for it to actually enter? Correct. Object objection. Calls for speculation. Yeah, sustained. Mr. And immediately following Mr. Jacobson going to his boat, what did you do? Stood there in shock. Okay. But you weren't still so shocked as to yell obscenities, correct? 
I think obscenities are a natural reaction to fear. Calling somebody a goddamn moron is a natural reaction to fear? Have you never had something traumatic happen to you, Mr. Depanik? I'm the one who asked the questions, Mr. Dieterle. Move to strike, non-responsive. Oh, Mr. Dieterle, he, uh, he gets to ask questions. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Okay, so you're standing there. Did Rod eventually come back from the boat? Yes. I, I'm sorry. Did he come back with candy in his arms? He came back carrying the dog, yes. What observations did you make of Candy the dog when she was walking back? She looked injured. Okay. And what was Rod's demeanor like? Threatening. And threatening. He looked at me and said, if, you, if something happens to this dog, you're going to be in big trouble. He drew out the big. Okay. And he, you said he pointed out a finger at you, correct? He said it again after he got, put the dog in the truck. Okay. And you were angry too, Mr. Dieterle, weren't you? I was angry I was put in that situation, yes. You were also angry that something on what you considered to be your property was roaming around, correct? I'm, Unleashed. I was irritated that it attacked me, yes. May I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes, sir. Showing defense counsel what's been previously admitted as Exhibit 6. Mm -hmm. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Uh, yes. This is Candy the dog, isn't it? Mr. It is. Dieterle. And this is her dead, correct? That's correct. And this is her dead at your hand, correct? Sadly, yes. I have no further questions. Mr. Dieterle, we're here in court because of a lawsuit, right? Correct. Uh, do you know when this lawsuit began? <sighs> Was it 2017 it got filed in, or? I know the incident happened in November 2016, so. August 2017 sound about right? About right, yes. So this lawsuit's been pending for almost five years? A little more than that, yeah. <laughs> and has, is this something that you've had to live through every day as a result of living through this lawsuit? Yes. So when you heard Mr. Timpanic ask you if this is, you're somehow miraculously remembering this five and a half years later. Is that true? No, because I relive it every damn day. Excuse me. Sorry, Your Honor. And during the course of this lawsuit, did you have your deposition taken? Yes. And do you recall when that was? I believe 2018. And would it have been early 2018? Yes. And... <laughs> Mr. Dieterle, this is, is this the first time you've told your story? It's the first time I have. In five and a half years? In five and a half years. When you shot the dog, it, it was close to you, correct? Very close. Okay. It wasn't immediately when it came out of the bushes, was it? No. And did you shoot the dog when it was right in front of you? Right in front of me, yes. You heard Mr. Jacobson testify during his uh, testimony that you uh, made the comment that you would do it again. 
Uh, did you make that comment to Mr. Jacobson? No, I don't ever want to have this happen again. And uh, Mr. Dieterle, did you shoot the dog in self-defense? I did. And is that because you had no other choice? I had exhausted all options, yes. I had nowhere to go. And thank you, Your Honor. That's all I have. No recross, Your Honor, necessary. So if you could um, return so we can commence trial starting at 1.30. All right. So leave your pads on the chairs and we'll see you back at 1.30. Uh, Okay, uh, again, if there's uh, any authority, case law that you'd like me to look at, uh, you have available now before we have our argument this afternoon. I'd appreciate uh, providing so I can use it in an hour to review. Uh, I've seen your memo already on yeah. the assault. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that. And do you still have the um, notebook that we provided you with the proposed jury instructions, Your Honor, with the case law? Um, I've got so many notebooks. I've got your proposed jury instructions and the verdict forms, uh, but there's nothing other than that. Okay. No. okay. All right, see you back at 1.30. Thank you, Your Honor. All rise. Court's in recess.
folks are coming back in, make sure your phones are off, please. All rise, sir, Aaron. All right, folks, take your seats. <clears throat> We're now in the uh, starting the defense case, uh, continuing with it. Call your next witness, Mr. Kessler. Your Honor, the defense calls Dr. Catherine Help. Doctor, this way, please. <clears throat> And if you'll stand here, face Madam Clerk, raise your right hand to be sworn. Please tell me the clear order of time the testimony of David This way, ma'am. You may want to get closer to the microphone. Good afternoon, Dr. Haupt. Can you uh, tell the members of the jury your name? Uh, Catherine Elbro Haupt. And what is your occupation? I'm a veterinary behaviorist. Do you have your bachelor's degree? Yes. What is your bachelor's degree in? In pre-vet, 1960. Do you have your veterinary medical degree? Yes. And what year did you receive that? 1963. And have you been licensed as a veterinarian since that time? Yes. What states are you licensed as a veterinarian? Uh, New York. Okay. Have you held licenses in other states? Yes, Pennsylvania and Michigan. Do you have any graduate degrees? Yes. And what is your graduate degree in? Uh, a PhD in behavioral biology. And when did you receive your PhD in behavioral biology? 1972. Do you have any specialty? I'm sorry? Do you specialize in Yes, I specialize medicine? in treating animals with behavior problems. And can you describe for the jury what it means to, uh, to have a specialty in that area? That means that in order to be a specialist, you have to have had uh, three years of training, pass an examination, publish a paper, and three case reports. And then you are uh, a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. Okay. Uh, generally, the um, area of clinical animal behavior, can you describe to the members of the jury what that is? That means that you treat dogs, cats, horses, whatever species that has a behavior problem that the owners cannot live with. What is your current title in your occupation right now? I'm Emeritus Professor of uh, Veterinary Behavioral Medicine. And where is that located? Cornell University. And what types of cases uh, do you treat there as emeritus professor? Uh, uh, behavior problems of dogs, which is mostly aggression and separation anxiety. Uh, behavior problems of cats and horses. Prior to your emeritus status at Cornell University, were you a full-time James Law professor of animal behavior there? Yes. And earlier on in your career, did you practice um, small animal veterinary medicine? Yes. Now I want to ask you, you had mentioned you were a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. Can you describe that organization to the jury? That's an organization of individuals who have gone through all the steps I described, publishing papers and passing an examination, uh, and therefore they are can call themselves specialists. And are you a diplomat in that organization? I'm a diplomat. I'm a founding diplomat. And how many diplomats are in the United States? There are about 100. Uh, do you, is, why is the um, membership so low in that organization? Well, it's relatively new and also, as you can hear, you have to go through a lot of steps in order to become a specialist in veterinary behavior. Are you also a member of the Animal Behavior Society? Yes. What is that organization? That's a group of individuals uh, who study animal behavior, both wild and domestic animal behavior. Are you also a member of the American Veterinary Medical Association? Yes. 
Can you describe that organization? That's an organization of people who graduated from uh, colleges of veterinary medicine. Have you authored any books, Dr. Haupt? Yes. Okay. And can you describe the books you've authored? Uh, the primary one is uh, Domestic Animal Behavior for Veterinarians and Animal Scientists. Okay. And is that the book on the edge of the council table there? Yes. Okay. How many editions is there of Domestic Animal Behavior? That's the sixth edition. I'm working on the seventh. And does your book, Domestic Animal Behavior, include research and information on the behavior of dogs? Yes. Okay. And does it also have fundamental teachings on the principles of animal behavior in your book? Yes. You had mentioned you had authored some other books. Can you describe those? I'm sorry. I still uh, can't hear. Have you contributed to other books in writing yes. them? Yes. And can you describe that? Uh, I've, I've written uh, chapters for several books on behavior, including dog behavior. Have you also published articles? Yes. Approximately how many articles have you published? Over a hundred. And within those articles, did the topics include dog aggression? Yes. Do you give presentations at meetings and conferences regarding dog aggression? Yes. And do you teach classes on dealing with aggressive dog behavior? Yes. In your work at Cornell University, have you done clinical behavior examinations of dogs? Yes. Approximately how many clinical behavior examinations would you estimate that you've done? Probably a thousand. And is that over the years of your career? Oh, over the many years, yes. Okay. And um, in your work at Cornell University, do you also provide treatment to help make aggressive dogs less aggressive? Yes. And could you describe the steps that you go through for treatment of dog aggression? The very first thing I do when a owner presents me with an aggressive dog is to advise them on how to protect the public. That is, how to keep the dog from hurting anyone by keeping it on a leash or behind a, a real fence. And what would be the next step in treatment of dog aggression? Uh, Sometimes behavior modification, trying to uh, teach the dog to like people, uh, and also we use uh, psychoactive medication to reduce the aggression of the dogs. Previously, have you ever served as an expert witness in a court case before? Yes. And in, when you're serving as an expert witness in court cases, is it common practice for you to be paid for your expert testimony? Yes. Within the expert testimony you've previously provided, has that include testimony on dog aggression? Yes. I want to ask you about your experience in studying and researching aggressive dogs. Can you explain the process of how you gather the information for that research? Well, we uh, have the owners fill out a 14-page questionnaire and that will indicate you know, how they feed the dog, how they take care of the dog, and also those situations which cause a dog to bark or growl or bite. Okay, and what are the next step inquiring information on the particular dog's <coughs> behavior? Um, uh, but then we look at how the dog acts, we test the dog, uh, not with real children or real dogs, we test the musy with a, a toddler doll and a stuffed dog. And um, you had mentioned that you've done a, estimate a thousand clinical behavior examinations. Can you explain what you have done with that research? Well, I hope we've cured some dogs, but we've also um, published papers showing what uh, kinds of cases we see, what the behavior problem is, and, and the kinds of dogs that are involved. And how many times has that been published? Uh, well, we published two um, studies of the cases that we've seen at Cornell. One that just came out and one 20 years ago. Okay. And over your career, have you gained a specialized knowledge of dog aggression? Yes. Okay. And uh, do you have a specialized knowledge regarding the characteristics of aggressive behavior in dogs? Yes. And is that specialized knowledge in part based upon your clinical behavior examinations? Yes. Is that specialized knowledge also based upon the research inf information you learned and studied while writing your book, Domestic Animal Behavior? Yes. Okay. 
and does your specialized knowledge also come from your actual treatment of aggressive dogs? Yes. Okay. And um, does your specialized knowledge come from any studies? Yes. Okay, and can you explain those studies? Well, we've looked at what sorts of problems we see and what uh, medications in particular are helpful in treating those dogs. And is that the studies that you had referenced previously that you did one currently and then one 20 years ago? Yes, okay. amongst others. Is your specialized knowledge also included a CDC study on dog aggression? Yes. Okay. And your compilation of the clinical animal uh, examinations that you've done, have uh, those been published? Yes. And have they been peer reviewed? Yes. Okay. And is those peer reviews and articles been accepted within the animal behavior community? Yes. And have you reliably used the information you've acquired um, with your specialized knowledge to know about the aggressive characteristics of dogs? Yes. Okay. Do other experts who are in the animal behavior community also form, um, have specialized knowledge uh, based upon the process that you've just described of how you acquired specialized knowledge? Yes. Okay, and is it the regular practice for experts to um, acquire that specialized knowledge based on how you've described it? Yes. Okay. I want to ask you a few questions about the characteristics of aggressive dogs and start by asking you, what is the most common behavioral issue in dogs? It is aggression. What is the best predictor of whether a dog will show aggression? The best predictor is whether it has shown aggression before. Okay. Now I want to ask you about some of the distinctions between characteristics of calm dogs and aggressive dogs. Can you describe visual signals to show that a dog is acting calmly? Calm dog will be relaxed in his body posture. His tail will be down, maybe wagging slightly. Uh, its mouth will be open and his tongue will be lolling. In his hair will not be standing up. Thank you. In contrast to calm dogs, can you describe the uh, characteristics of an, a dog that's acting aggressively? Aggressive dog will be stiff in his body posture. Its tail will be up. Uh, maybe wagging slowly. Uh, its hair will be standing up. It's, that's called its hackles will rise. Uh, it will be showing its teeth, especially the front teeth. Okay. Dr. Haup, are spayed female dogs more aggressive than non-spayed female dogs? Yes. And can you explain why that is? We think that's because when a dog is spayed, you remove the ovaries as well as the uterus, and the ovaries produce progesterone, and that tends to be a calming uh, hormone. Is barking an indication of aggression? Depends on the bark. The, Can there, you describe that distinction? Yes, the, um, there's the bark that means, you know, I want to come in the house, like arf, arf, arf or the bark that means I'm aggressive, which is rough, rough. Okay. Can you describe what it means for a dog to become territorial? That means that the dog does not want another person or dog to enter what it perceives as its territory. Do dog, dogs bark to protect that territory? Yes. Okay. And how do dogs um, determine what is their territory? Well, it depends where they spent most of their time. So if they spend a lot of time in a given place, they tend to be more likely to show territorial behavior toward it. What about the example of a truck? If a dog oftentimes rides in the truck of its owner, um, is that an instance where a dog can become territorial? Yes, many dogs, even dogs that are fine otherwise, will often be aggressive about the vehicle, and that's Partly because they've spent a lot of time in it, it smells like them, it smells like the owner, um, and it's also easily guarded because essentially they have a shell around them, so they will be more likely to be territorial around a car. Okay. And if a dog were territorial in a vehicle, what are signs of aggression 
in that dog. But then again, its hackles will be up. It would be approaching someone who is trying to enter the surroundings of the vehicle. Uh, it would be growling, snarling. Okay. Uh, would there be any lunging involved? Yes. Okay. And does, if a dog has become territorial with a vehicle, does that extend to land outside of the vehicle? Yes. Uh, the, and the same thing is true of a dog on its territory at home. Its territory may be bigger than your property line. Okay. And what would be signs of aggression if a dog were being territorial on the land near a vehicle that it considered its well, territory? Barking aggressively, uh, approaching, hackles up. Okay. Anything else? Uh, I mean, I think that's enough. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Halp, are you able to socialize an adult dog? It's very difficult to socialize an adult dog. The socialization period for dogs is between 7 and 14 weeks. And after that, you may habituate the dog to you know, people approaching or bicycles, uh, but you won't truly socialize it. Okay. Um, if I could have exhibit, I believe it's 14. Dr. Hobb, I'm going to show you an exhibit in a moment. Okay. It's going to come up on the screen in front of you. And Your Honor, I think you need to uh, give control to the table over here. It's to back up. The annotate features is great. Oh, that shows it's on. Can we turn the you can go ahead and turn the annotation feature off, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Dr. Haupt, do you see the exhibit uh, that's in front of you, the x-ray of um, the dog in this case? Yes. Okay. Are you familiar with what a prong collar is? Yes. And do you see the prong collar in this exhibit? Yes. Okay. What is the purpose of a prong collar? The uh, purpose of the prong collar is to exert pressure, pain, on the dog when uh, the leash is pulled. Okay. And what would be the reason for that? The reason could be that, that the dog um, likes to pull, likes to get away, so if you want to control it, um, you could use a prong collar. Okay. Uh, does the use of a prong collar uh, make a dog more aggressive? There is no published study on that, but most behaviorists think that it tends to make the dog worse because every time he lunges for somebody, he gets a pain in the neck, so he's not going to be very predisposed to like the people he's lunging toward if he associates them with that pain. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Help. That's all I have for you. Good afternoon, Dr. Hoff. Good afternoon. You are a paid expert witness, correct? That's right. And can you tell the jury what is your hourly rate? $250 an hour. Do you get paid if you travel? Yes. And what is your rate if you travel? $1,000 a day. Do you get your expenses paid for? Yes. Airfare? Yes. Hotel? Yes. And in preparation for this case, did you speak to any witnesses? No. Did you go out to the scene at all? No. What Did you just review a few depositions for this case? It seemed like a lot of depositions, but yes. I'd say. Um, what you stated about a pinch collar, that's not all of the reasons one would put a pinch collar on, correct? That's the only one I know of is to control the dog. Okay. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you, Dr. Howell. You can step down. So, uh, if we could have a um, conference with you first, Judge. All right.
All right. Uh, you call your next witness, Ms. Johnson. Uh, the defense calls Richard Mulvihill. <coughs> That's M U L V I H I L L. Yes. Mr. Richard Mulvihill. Yes. Yes, sir. Please make sure you're on the sir. Follow me. Sir, if you'll stand here, please, Madam Clerk, raise your right hand and sworn. Please solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give on the truth, the whole truth, and the whole truth. Yes. This way, sir. Good afternoon. Could you please state your name? Richard Mulvihill. And what is your occupation? I work for Southern Spring and Stamping. And who is your supervisor? Uh, Jeff Dieterle. Is that Zach's father? Yes, it is. And um, uh, what specifically do you do um, at your job? I oversee sales and manufacturing. Okay. Have you ever met the plaintiff, Rodney Jacobson? Yes, I have. And where was it that you met the plaintiff? <clears throat> On the uh, Luella Lane property. Do you recall when that was? Yeah, it would have been uh, late July, early August 2016. Okay. And what was the occasion that you were at the Luella Lane property? I was using the uh, property uh, for the weekend to store my boat at the dock. And did you have permission to be there? Yes, I did. Who else were you there with? I was with my wife and my son and my daughter. Okay. And at the time, were your children young children? Yeah, they were school age, um, middle school, elementary school, I believe. Okay. And what was the plaintiff doing at the Luella Lane property when you saw him? <clears throat> he was um, taking objects from his boat to his truck. Okay. And did you interact with the plaintiff? I did. And can you describe that? Sure. As we uh, got to the dock, we were out for the day uh, boating. We got to the dock and uh, Mr. Jacobson was at the dock. And I introduced myself. Um, as he was unloading items and putting them into his truck and uh, we were unloading items to go to our truck. Okay, and was plaintiff's dog with him? Uh, yes. If you could pull up exhibit 13, please. Mr. Mulvihill, you're being shown uh, Exhibit 13, which has been admitted into evidence. Is that the dog you referred to as plaintiff's dog? Yes. Okay. And before we get into um, the experience you had with plaintiff's dog, do you have any experience in identifying uh, types of dogs? I do. Um, we had a uh, dog kennel, a family dog kennel for many years, and uh, I became familiar with different breeds throughout that time. Okay. And when you first saw the plaintiff's dog, did you recognize that as a pit bull or yes. a pit bull mix? Yes, I did. Okay, and how is it that you were able to recognize the dog as a pit bull? Um, just experience of, uh, of, of dealing with, with pit bulls. It was that your experience at the kennel? Uh, yes, experience at the kennel. Okay, and um, what what has been your experience with pit bulls at the kennel? Well, we had uh, our insurance did not also, did not allow us to um, board pit bulls, um, but on a, on a couple occasions we did have them. Uh, in both incidences, they were negative interactions. We had one he threw a chain link fence, and we had one that attacked my wife. Okay. Turning back to um, when you were at the property in 2016, um, when did you first see the plaintiff's dog on the property? As we were unloading my boat, going to my vehicle, to my truck, uh, we had to pass by uh, the, the truck that he was using to load the items, and as we there was a narrow walkway as we passed by the truck. 
Um, we did not know there was a dog in there, but the dog lunged at the, the window, scratched, um, clawed at the window, growled, barked. And what did you do? Uh, got my family to uh, my vehicle, um, tried to get them there safely. Okay. And um, did you continue walking by the truck? We did. We had to pass by because it was a narrow uh, walkway. There was, uh, it was backed into the, the shell area towards the dock, and we had to uh, pass narrowly next to the vehicle because of uh, trees and bushes on the south side and mud and uh, some things on the, on the north side. And uh, that's when we passed by on the passenger side of the vehicle. Okay. And, um how you described it, was it acting aggressively towards you and your family? I would describe it as very aggressive. Okay. Um, what do you recall about it being, a, it, it, let me clarify, was it inside the truck? It was inside the truck, yes. Okay. And can you explain its behavior? Again, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was clawing at the window. Um, I don't remember if the window was all the way up or partially up, but I had um, concern that the dog was going to get out of the truck, okay. and um, you know, my at that time my responsibility was to get my family to to my vehicle, get them inside the truck. And did you do that because um, you were concerned about the behavior of the dog possibly harming your family? Yes, and I continued to unload my boat by myself um, when I first approached the dock when Mr. Uh, Jacobson was unloading his boat. I offered to help. I saw some of the items were heavier, so I offered to help him, so I had to return to help him as well. Okay. Uh, based on what you saw from the dog inside of the truck, were you afraid for the safety of your family? I was, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mulvihill. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. You work for Mr. Dieterle's father, correct? Yes. Do you consider you and Mr. Dieterle's father friends? I've worked for him for 26 years. That wasn't my question. As friendly as you can be for an employer that's treated you right for 26 years. And have you ever, you ever hang out with them after work? Most of our interaction is around business. Um, as far as hang out with them outside of work, not really, no. But not entirely. Not entirely what? You do sometimes hang out with Mr. Dieterle's father after work, correct? In a, in a business uh, setting, yes. Does that include drinking alcohol or something like that? Would that be a social business setting after work on a Friday or something? No, we don't hang out to drink alcohol together. Okay. And this interaction with Candy the dog it didn't bite you, correct? That's correct. It didn't jump on you, correct? Correct. It didn't bite any member of your family? That's correct. It didn't jump on any member of your family? Correct. In fact, it was in a car that where the windows were up, correct? Yes. So that dog could not have gotten at any one of you or your family, correct? That's not correct. Explain how when the windows are up, the doors are closed, how, couldn't, how could the animal get out? Uh, animals can get through uh, windows, doors. Like I said, my experience with the breed, I've had a, a pit bull eat through a chain link fence. And, but you did testify that it tried to get through the window and failed, correct? Tried to get through the window and failed? Yeah, because it was jumping up against the window. That was your testimony. It was actively um, aggressively acting towards us. Okay. Sure. Have you ever been barked at by another dog? Uh, yes. Frequently? I would say yes. And did you consider those interactions aggressive? I've had aggressive interactions with animals before. Okay. But not all, not all dogs who bark at you are aggressive, correct? No, not necessarily. No. As somebody who used to have a dog kennel, you were one would assume barked at numerous times by dogs, correct? Correct. And all of those times weren't aggressive, correct? 
all the times we're not aggressive. No further questions. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. You're excused. Your Honor, the defense calls uh, Brian Williams to the stand. Please. Sir, if you'll stand here, please, Madam Clerk, raise your right hand if you sworn. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will continue to the church and the church and the church? Yes, I do. This way, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Can you uh, please uh, tell the jury your name? Brian Williams. And Mr. Williams, uh, where do you currently live? In Venice. And what is your current occupation? I'm a property maintenance handyman. And do you maintain uh, the property located at 220 Luella Lane, Nokomis, Florida? Yes. And how often do you visit the Luella Lane property? About a couple times a week. Uh, in 2016, did you visit the property more? Yeah, in 2016, I was out there. We had different projects going on besides just general upkeep, so I was out there more often. And Mr. Williams, I'm having a hard time hearing if you could pull your microphone closer or, you know, thank you. Uh, can you go ahead and restate that answer again? I said in uh, 2016 I was out there more often because we had projects going on besides just general maintenance and upkeep. Okay. Uh, with those projects that were going on in 2016, did you ever observe nails laying on the ground? Yeah, quite often. And are there still nails to this day out on the property? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I picked up a whole handful Tuesday when I was out there. I'm going to go ahead and I will pull up exhibit number... Thirty-five, please. Go ahead and turn to the second page, please. Mr. Williams, I'm, I'm showing you what's been previously admitted into evidence as Exhibit 35, which are surveys of the Luella Lane property. Are you familiar with the layout here on the second page of the survey? Yeah, I'm just trying to get it all straight. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are you familiar with the woodshed also, what's been referred to here as the pump house? Yes. When you were doing projects or when there were projects being done on the property in 2016, were there ever any dumpsters or dump trailers on the property? Yes. And where were those uh, located? Well, when they were working up by the house, they had it up in front of the garage there, and then they moved it down along the path and put parked it like right in front of the, what you're calling the woodshed there, right in that pathway area there because <coughs> they were tearing the roof off of that in a gazebo so they were hauling the stuff across there and that's where they had the dump trailer down on where you do you see where it's notated shell path on the survey yeah that's where it was parked almost right where that arrow was okay and do you know whose dump trailer uh, or dumpster it was that was doing the projects on the property uh, I think it belonged to Rod. He was, it was him and his crew that was doing the work out there, Rod Jacobson and Island Builders. Okay. And do you know Mr. Jacobson? Yeah, I know who he is. I know him. And how do you know him? From him doing work on the properties that were the same places where I was working. And how long have you known Mr. Jacobson for? Uh, I think 2014, I think I met him the first time. 2014. Is that when you moved to the Venice area? Yes. And had you ever seen Mr. Jacobson at the Luella Lane property? Yeah, quite often. And when you would see Mr. Jacobson at the Luella Lane property, did you have an opportunity to interact with his dog, Candy? Yeah, a few times. Were you able to observe what type of breed Candy was? I would call her a pit bull. And how were you able to tell that she was a pit bull? Just by her confirmation, she had, you know, small dog, stocky, 
blocky head. Do you own pit bulls? Yeah, I've owned pit bulls for most of my life. If we can go ahead and pull up exhibit six, please. Or excuse me, uh, exhibit 13, I'm sorry. Is this a, a picture of Candy of the dog that you would see on the Luella Lane property? Yes. Okay, you can take it down. Uh, did you ever observe uh, Mr. Jacobson's dog wander about the Luella Lane property? Yeah, she was always just wandering free out there when he was out there. And what did you observe of Candy as she was wandering the Luella Lane property? Usually she was chasing around in the bushes and the shrubs and palmettos, chasing lizards around, trying to kill them. And how would you describe her uh, behavior when she was doing this? Ah, she was pretty wound up, frantic, chasing, you know, trying to kill them lizards. She was after them. Uh, did you ever observe Candy run on the property? Well, not so much run. She stayed in the bushes and, you know, I never really saw her run, you know, I mean, running, running across the property, nothing like that. But. Did you ever observe Mr. Jacobson lose track of his dog? Yeah, a couple of times. You said a couple of times? Yes. And uh, did you interact with Mr. Jacobson after he had lost track of his dog? Yeah, I helped him find it. Okay. Did he seem concerned? Yeah. He, he, the, the one time, I, I noticed he was walking around looking like he was, he was looking for something, and I didn't know what he was looking for exactly. And so I, I said, would you lose something, Rod? And he said, oh, my dog, she wandered off. And I said, well, which way did she go? And he said, I, the last I saw her, she was headed up this way. So I started, he was walking around one part of the property, and I walked out the front of the property and started looking for her. And I walked out into, out in the road out there, Luella Lane, and then I walked down, I didn't see her, and I walked down towards uh, Circuit Road around the corner there, and she was down there on the side of the road chasing lizards, whatever she was doing, digging them, tearing stuff up in the bushes there. So I went down there and got her. She had a little, she was dragging a little short leash. So I got a hold of the leash and I took that back to her and told her out. I found her out there by the road and gave it to her. And he said, she didn't hurt you or nothing, did she? I said, no, she didn't hurt me. I didn't give her back to him. And no. he took her and he put her in his truck, I believe. Uh, did Mr. Jacobson ever tell you why he was concerned uh, whenever he would lose track of his dog? Well, when the first time I ever saw Candy out there, Rod had her, he was working on his boat down by the boat dock, similar to that, where that area where I said that the thing was parked, he would park his truck down there and then he'd work, because he'd carry his stuff to the boat dock. So he was down there and I had come out there to do some work and I seen his truck down there. So I thought I'd go down and say hi to Rod, let him know I was out there. So when I went down there, I got near his truck, all of a sudden that dog come running out from under the bushes there. She was all vicious looking and pawing at the ground like coming after me, you know, and I didn't know he had a dog at that time. I hadn't seen the dog before. And she come running out there, you know, and growling at me with her hair all stuck up and everything. So I, I, I jumped back and I hollered at her. I don't know, I think I kicked some shell at her or something. And I, and I hollered at Rod. I said, Rod, is this your dog? And he said, oh yeah, yeah, just a minute. He come running out there and he, he got her. And you know, when he got out there, he hollered something. He hollered her name or something. And she kind of circled around by him like she was by him then, you know. So he picked her up and put her in the back of his truck. And I said, well, you know, if she's your dog, that's okay. I didn't, you know, I'm, I just didn't know who she was. I never seen the dog. She scared the crap out of me. And he said, well, I'd rather just put her in the truck here and be safe. He said, uh, he started explaining to me that she was a rescue dog he had rescued and how she'd had a bunch of puppies and they kept the dog and got rid of the puppies. And he, uh, didn't, he thought she'd been abused and stuff from what he, what he knew about her and he, he was trying to get her acclimated to being around people so that's why he was bringing her with him when he went places. And, uh, but he, he said he just felt safer putting her in the truck for now, that's what he told me. So. And did Mr. Jacobson ever tell you to stay away from the dog? He didn't say so much. Well, I can't say he said didn't say. At one time when uh, me and my girlfriend came out there, I was coming out there to do some work and she came with me. and. Uh, we were, we had pulled up, there's like a carport thing there and I parked my truck under there when I'm out there a lot of times. So I pulled up under there and Rod was down, down by the boat dock where he parked and he was coming up with the dog and we got out of the truck and uh, she had asked me, my girlfriend had asked me, you know, who's that? I said, oh, that's Rod, whatever, he's a friend of Dee's, he keeps his boat out here when I was trying to explain. And uh, he was coming up with a dog and she likes dogs and she says, oh, dog, she started to say hi or something and Rod said, oh, stay back, stay back. And she, she was like, 
what's that all about? And I said, oh, he's got his dog and he don't trust that dog. I don't think so. We went up to the cabin and he went the other way or whatever. Okay. Uh, you testified that there was a uh, decorative fence at the Luella Lane property, or are you familiar with there being a decorative <coughs> fence at the Luella yeah, Lane property? Yeah, a big board fence runs partially around the property. It's like two boards and I don't know, it's probably a foot off the ground, a foot between boards or so. Mostly, like, kind of look like a, a horse ranch fence or something, you know, it's not, not really for containment. Can we pull up exhibit 36, please, second page? And do you recognize this in the picture? Yeah, that's the fence, sir. That's the fence at the, Lowell, at the Luella Lane property? Yep. And you're very familiar with that property, right? Yeah. Uh, does this fence run all the way around the property? No, it runs across the front, and then it runs down Circuit Road, and then it stops, and then the whole one side, the, the other side of the property, the north side of the property is all open. You know, you can go out through there. And I believe you testified that one of the encounters that you had with uh, Mr. Jacobson's dog was that it had escaped out of the fence, and you went to retrieve it. Yeah, either it had gone under the fence like up here in the front or else it went out that other that far side behind the cabin and it could just, you know, there's no fence at all over there. It could go around and come back out on the road. I don't know which way it went. Did Mr. Jacobson ever tell you that he was scared of his dog hurting somebody? He just kind of acted like he was. Like I said, when he told me he kept it to, uh, he was trying to get it, to, you know, acclimated being around people and uh, he had said that, no. Uh, I don't know, he, he just acted like he, you know, he didn't completely tr trust the dog and he didn't want to take any chances with it. He, he even said that he brought the dog with him when he, when he worked, because he was hoping to get it used to people, but he also didn't want to leave it home with his other dogs because he didn't feel like he trusted it. And that's why I told him, yeah, well, you know, pit bulls, you got to be careful with them because they're kind of tough. I was going to talk to him, you know, about pit bull. I didn't know what he knew, but he claimed that, oh, the dog, it wasn't a pit bull, it was a Staffordshire Terrier. And so I, don't, I didn't get into it with him. Okay. Uh, your two encounters with Mr. Jacobson's dog, did you ever tell Zach Dieterle about any of those encounters? Objection calls for hearsay. Overruled. No, I've never talked to Zach. Did you ever tell uh, Mr. Dieterle's father, Jeffrey Dieterle, about your encounters with the plaintiff's dog, Candy? No. Did you ever tell uh, Jeff Dieterle about your conversations with Mr. Jacobson? Objection calls for hearsay. Um. The question that... No, I'm going to allow it. Go ahead. No. And did you ever tell Zach Dieterle about your conversations with Mr. Jacobson? No. You're going to be asked these questions, I'm sure. The dog never bit you, right? No. Okay, the dog never jumped on you, did it? No, no. Okay. That's all the questions I have for this witness at this time, Your Honor. Thank you. No cross necessary, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, thank you. Your Honor, we, we may have one more witness that we can call today, but I would just ask the court if we take a five minute recess so I can confirm. Okay. Uh Tell you what, uh, let me let me know when the witness is here. We'll resume then. Okay. Sounds All right. Good. Thank you, folks. See you in fifty right. minutes. All rise. The court's in a recess.
Okay. So, Your Honor, uh, Mr. Timpanic and I and, and Ms. Johnson have had a discussion. Uh, we're not going to call any witnesses today, so we'll go into um, the argument, and then we intend on picking back up Monday morning. We believe that we'll be done with our case either Monday night or early Tuesday morning. Okay. Well, let's don't predict that for the jury yet. Oh, I agree with you. Until we have a firm situation here. Um, so I'm going to call the jury back and let them go for the day. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, folks, you can be seated. So we're still in the defense case. Um, we're not going to be able to have any uh, additional witnesses today. I hope you won't be disappointed. I'm going to let you go early. Um, but have you come back on Monday. Uh, the lawyers and I have got some work to do here this afternoon. There's no point in you sticking around for that. So um, let's say 9.30 on Monday. And uh, I remind you not to do any sort of outside research. Stay away from any media or news reports. And enjoy your weekend. We'll see you back here Monday. Jurors exiting. Please leave your notepads. Okay, be seated. <coughs> okay, we'd reserved on uh, defense motions at the close of uh, plaintiff's case in chief. I tell you what, it, uh, I'm okay if council wants to remain seated. You can do it standing or seating, whichever is comfortable. Okay, Your Honor, but I have a uh, book here. I know you said that you had had the um, jury instructions and stuff like that up there with you, but I don't believe you have the case law. Um, so I'm going to give my book to you. We were unable to make additional copies. I'll show it to Mr. Tempanic first, and then if you want a book with the case law up there, or if not. Are you sacrificing that binder? Or are you? <laughs> I think so, Your Honor. Or do you want it back? And we'll share that one. Okay. Yeah, you can have it, Your Honor, and we'll share this one, or we'll share the one Miss Johnson has. Okay. So we'll sacrifice it. You're going to do this by counts? 
So, uh, Your Honor, the way I envision this going is we're going to, I'm going to move for a directed verdict based on punitive damages as a whole, uh, and then we'll go count by count, Your Honor. Okay. So let's take it, so um, give Mr. Timpanic an opportunity to rebut each issue so he doesn't have to wait to the end to do everything. I will, Your Honor. So I'll address the punitive damages by each count. Well, just let me ask. Sure. Um, Mr. Timpanic, um, What's your position on the quality of the case for punitive damages? Well, Your Honor, the, I believe the precedent will be set in Brooks v. Rios, and that is, I'll say it slowly so everyone can write it down, 707 Southern 2nd, 374. Okay, have you got a copy of that? I can, set, I can email it to, I've already done a, I've already downloaded it to you know, okay. save some paper. I can send you and Mr. Kessler, email it to you right now, so you'll have it right on your screen. You can go ahead, um, Mr. Kessler. Thank you, Your Honor. This relates to the negligence count. Uh, I'm going to begin with the count one, which is the intentional affliction of emotional distress, Your Honor. Uh, the IIE, IIED count is an intentional tort. In view of the evidence that's presented, been presented by the plaintiff in his case in chief, in a light most favorable to the plaintiff, the plaintiff has failed to demonstrate that Mr. Dieterle had actual knowledge of the wrongfulness of his conduct and the high probability that injury or damage to the plaintiff would occur. And that despite that knowledge, he intentionally pursued the course of conduct which resulted in injury to the plaintiff. The punitive damages statute, Your Honor, is section 768.73, excuse me, 768.72. And I'm looking at subsection 2A and uh, the statute specifically states, a defendant may be held liable for punitive damages only if the trier fact, based on clear and convincing evidence, finds the defendant was personally guilty of intentional misconduct. Uh, subsection 2A defines intentional conduct uh, as the defendant had actual knowledge of the wrongfulness of the conduct and the high probability that injury or damage to the claimant would result and despite that knowledge, intentionally pursued that course of conduct, resulting in injury or damage. As it pertains to the intentional infliction of emotional distress count, Your Honor, uh, the plaintiff has, number one, failed to show that, the, uh, m that Mr. Dieterle had actual knowledge of the wrongfulness of his conduct. Uh, the evidence that was presented during the plaintiff's case in chief, uh, the testimony of the sheriff's office and the sheriff's records that they had uh, done an investigation and found that Mr. Dieterle uh, acted appropriately under the circumstances and that his conduct was actually justified based on their investigation. So the uh, plaintiff has failed to um, satisfy that. They also failed to satisfy that Mr. Dieterle uh, had actual knowledge uh, that a high probability of injury or damage to Mr. Jacobson would result uh, from his conduct. In fact, the evidence elicited from the plaintiff and other witnesses during the plaintiff's case in chief showed that one, Mr. Dieterle never pointed his gun at the plaintiff, never fired in the direction of the plaintiff, and the plaintiff uh, even had to correct his testimony and state that at the time of the shooting that he was actually shoulder to shoulder with Mr. Dieterle, indicating that at no time was he in front of Mr. Dieterle when Mr. Dieterle was uh, firing the firearm. And then you have to put the qualifier in there that despite all that knowledge, Mr. Dieterle still intentionally pursued that course of conduct resulting in injury or damage. Uh, there's just no evidence to that, Your Honor. The evidence uh, shows that uh, he shot at the dog three times um, and uh, as a result of the investigation by the sheriff's office, his conduct was deemed to be lawful and justified. And as the court uh, is well aware, the standard for punitive damages is clear and convincing evidence. Uh, so it's not uh, subject to the preponderance of the evidence standard, which is 50.1%. 
but in fact the higher standard of clear and convincing evidence. So the uh, defendant, Mr. Dieter, would move that the uh, request for punitive damages in count one of the amended complaint for intentional infliction of emotional distress uh, that a uh, verdict be entered in his favor. Uh, Mr. Timpanic. Yes, Your Honor. First, as to the intentional affliction of emotional distress, plaintiff uh, has, I'm um, going to be referring upon Laporta, the Associated Independence Incorporated. This is a Florida Supreme Court case uh, discussing it is actually the anguish result. So this is dealing with pain and suffering associated with losing a pet. This is obviously a Supreme Court case, citation 163. Southern 2nd, 267. The anguish resulting from the mishandling of a body of a child cannot be equated to the grief and loss of a dog, but that does not imply that mental suffering from the loss of a dog is nothing at all. In that, Your Honor, the, uh, in that case, I was on appeal that their court remarked, talking about how the case is purely in tort where the wrongful act is such reasonable to imply malice or in the great indifference to person's property or rights of the other, such as malice, will be imputed as would justify the assessment exemplary or punitive damages. It's been w well established that defendant's conduct, firing multiple shots, including, as we heard today from Dr. Ellis, the shot that actually killed Candy the dog was from the side. Mr. Dieterle's actions were an extreme indifference to not only human life, but the indifference to great persons, property of rights, or others. Unfortunately, we, the rights of uh, the property of a dog is still property under Florida law. So his actions by shooting and killing even, and as we heard, his testimony had changed. He originally said that in his uh, original report to law enforcement, and that was part of the reason his case was ultimately dismissed, I mean, they declined to pursue charges, is that he fired three shots sequentially. However, that's not what he said today. He said he also didn't remember. He said he didn't think he hit any of them, but today he was able to say first shot missed, second shot missed, third shot hit. And based on Dr. Ellis's testimony, that dog was shot from the side and eventually was killed from a bullet that did not enter from the front as alleged, but from the side. Uh, based on that case law, and Your Honor, I'll obviously send this to you as well, this is, this is the case that's right on point uh, where um, the case uh, jury awarded damages based on the uh, emotional distress associated from the loss of a dog. The appellant appealed and got to the Supreme Court and they upheld it, um, Your Honor. And we'd be saying that also additionally, it's been well established. Mr. Uh, Jacobson was there. You heard from every single person that day, including Mr. Dieterle here himself, Mr. Jacobson. Miss Ellis, Miss Morris, all the people could say that uh, the uh, stress of the situation what Mr. Jacobson was going through, and then in the years that followed, including going to Dr. Edlin for, and being diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, from Cindy Watson saying about how he'd wake up in the middle of the night screaming and yelling and chasing Zach, and it didn't happen one time, it happened numerous times. So, Your Honor, based on what we say, and including the, on what plaintiff believes is on point case law, we'd be asking you to deny that motion for judgment, uh, motion for directed verdict. Uh, are you familiar with those cases? I am, Your Honor, but I believe counsel is referring the uh, underlying case. I haven't moved for a directed verdict on count one entirely. I've moved for a directed verdict as to the punitive damages. And, Your Honor, as to the punitive damages, uh, as you saw with the allegations and how many shots were fired and how the dog was shot and multiple, as noted by uh, Wendy Ellis, there was at least one gunshot wound from the side and she suspected another from on the right elbow, which indicates that Mr. Dieterle obviously did not either tell the truth to law enforcement or he didn't tell the truth today. And his extreme and uh, reckless conduct firing a firearm We've just heard from numerous witnesses who've had other interactions, including Mr. Williams, who had a similar one, uh, interaction with, Mr., uh, with Candy the dog. None of those individuals shot and killed the dog. And we'd be saying that the 
conduct was exceptionally reckless, including, uh, like I said, Mr. Dieterle had the ability to go simply to the doctor before Mr. Jacobson was. This is not a stand your ground case. There's no, that this is a situation where um, the dog never bit him, it never uh, jumped on him, it just, it literally was barking at him and Mr. Dieterle shot it. We consider firing multiple gunshots, including one from the side, to be extreme indifference to human life and extremely reckless. And punitive damages for that count, Your Honor, based on the facts as they have been stated, is warranted here. Did you want to address the, um, the grounds itself? You talked about the punitives. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the, are we talking about the punitives or are we talking about the underlying action? Underlying action. Sure, let's go ahead and address the underlying action. Uh, Your Honor, the plaintiff, or the defendant, Mr. Dieter, we would move for a directed verdict on the count for intentional infliction of emotional distress. Uh, in his amended complaint, the plaintiff seeks to recover damages for intentional infliction of emotional distress. For the following reasons, Mr. Dieterle is entitled to a directed verdict as to the plaintiff's claim for intentional infliction of emotional distress. Uh, one reason is the uh, requisite element of outrageousness. Uh, a requisite element, element of intentional infliction of emotional distress is that the alleged conduct was outrageous, that is, as to go beyond all bounds of decency and to be regarded as odious and utterly intolerable in a civilized community. And that is a uh, case out of the third DCA, Legrand v. Emanuel, 889, Southern 2nd, 991, found at page 994. Further, the restatement of torts defines the requisite extreme and outrageous conduct as that which is so outrageous in character and so extreme in degree as to go beyond all possible bounds of decency and to be regarded as atrocious and utterly intolerable in a civilized community. Generally, the case is one in which the recitation of the facts to an average member of the community would arouse his resentment against the actor and lead him to exclaim outrageous. And that's from the Restatement Second of Torts, Section, six, section 46, from 1965. It is not enough that the intent is tortious or criminal. It is not enough that the defendant intended to inflict emotional distress. And it is not enough if the conduct was characterized by malice or aggravation, which would entitle the plaintiff to punitive damages for another tort. And that's a direct quote from a fifth DCA case, State Farm Mutual Auto Incorporated Company v. Novotny, 657, Southern 2nd, 1210, found at pages 1212 through 13. In applying that standard, it is manifest that the subjective response of the person who is the target of the actor's conduct is not to control the question of whether the tort occurred. Rather, an evaluation of the claimed misconduct must be undertaken to determine, as objectively as is possible, whether it is atrocious and utterly tolerable in a civilized community. And that's a quote uh, from the second DCA case, Potton v. Scarfone, 468 Southern 2nd, 1009, found at page 1011. The Novotny case also uh, discusses the same concept at 657 Southern 2nd at 1213. And I quote, the subjective response of the person who is the target of the actor's conduct does not control the question of whether the tort occurred. Whether alleged conduct is outrageous enough to support a claim for intentional infliction of emotional distress is a matter of law, not a question of fact. And that is a second DCA case, Gandhi v. Trans World Computer Technology Group, 787 Southern 2nd, 116, found at page 119. That concept is also stated in a third DCA case, Deauville, D-E-A-U-V-I-L-L-E, -E, Hotel Management, LLC, V. Ward, found at 219 Southern 3rd, 949, found at page 955. It's very important to stress, Your Honor, that 
the outrageousness element requisite to sustain a cause of action for intentional infliction of emotional distress is a matter of law for the court to consider and it's the uh, and it's not the subjective belief of the person who is I guess who receives the conduct that controls but rather you have to look at it objectively when we look at all of the evidence that the plaintiff presented during its case in chief uh, Mr. Dieterle's conduct is, as a matter of law, not sufficiently outrageous enough for the plaintiff to prevail on a cause of action for intentional infliction of emotional stress. The other element uh, requisite for a cause of action for intentional infliction of emotional distress is that the um, emotional distress has to be so severe or long-lasting. And that's found at Lagrange. 889 Southern 2nd at 994. The Second District Court of Appeals discussed. Oh, I didn't get that last slide. Sorry, Your Honor. That's 889 Southern 2nd at 994. And the primary site for the Legrand case, Your Honor, is 889 Southern 2nd, 991. The Second District Court of Appeal discussed the severity element in Kim V. Jung, J-U-N-G, Hyun, H-Y-U-N, Chang, C-H-A-N-G, found at 249 Southern 3rd, 1300. To qualify as severe, emotional distress must be of such a substantial quality or enduring quality that no reasonable person in a civilized society should be expected to endure it. In evaluating the severity of an incident, the intensity and the duration of the distress are relevant factors. The standard to satisfy severity is high to prevent the tort from becoming a venue for litigation over every emotional injury. In viewing the evidence that the, that the plaintiff has presented in his case in chief, in a light most favorable to him, he fails to satisfy the high burden of demonstrating that his emotional distress was of such a substantial quality or enduring quality that no reasonable person in a civilized society should be expected to endure it. The evidence has shown that the plaintiff himself completed annual wellness exam forms in 2016 just four days after the incident in this case occurred, and 2017, a year after the incident in this case occurred, in which he disclosed to his primary care physician that he almost never felt sad or depressed during the previous six months. The plaintiff saw a psychiatrist for his alleged emotional distress a total of five times for a cumulative total of three hours over a period of eight months. The first visit to the psychiatrist was nearly two years after the incident occurred. And the last visit was on May 29, 2019, over three years ago. As you heard the plaintiff testify, he has not sought any effort or made any effort to seek any treatment for his alleged emotional distress in over three years, Your Honor. And even then, it's questionable as to why he sought emotional treatment in the first place nearly two years after the incident occurred, especially given the evidence that on August 13th, 2018, a notice was filed where, and the defendant was going to seek his medical records. And I don't find it to be a coincidence that two days later is the first time that he showed up at his primary care doctor complaining of worsening depression as a result of this incident. The plaintiff had a long-standing history of depression. In fact, he had been taking antidepressants for over 15 years prior to the incident in this case, stemming from an emotional disturbance that he experienced with his ex-wife. The plaintiff has sought little to no treatment, incurred no out-of-pocket expenses, and remained on the same antidepressant medication after the incident that he had been on for 15 years prior to the incident. It wasn't until after he sustained a traumatic brain injury during his fall where he fractured his skull in January of 2021 
that he began to experiencing experience worsening depression, wherein he started taking other antidepressants, two new antidepressants, because the Zoloft was no longer working for him. In conclusion, Mr. Dieterle's alleged outrageous conduct is, as a matter of law, insufficient for a claim of intentional infliction of emotional distress. Further, the plaintiff did not suffer severe or long-lasting emotional distress, enough for a claim of intentional infliction of emotional distress. As a result, a directed verdict as to the claim for intentional infliction of emotional distress found in count one of the amended complaint should be entered in favor of Mr. Dieterle, and we ask the court to do that. Anything you want to add? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, just quoting from Laporta. The district court held generally in the case, uh, we can skip this, it is improper to include the, uh, the restriction of the loss of a pet to its intrinsic value and circumstance, such as ones before us, is a principle we cannot accept. Without, without indulging in a discussion of affinity between sentimental value and, pub, and mental suffering, we feel that the affection of a master for his dog is a, really, a very real thing, that the malicious destruction of the pet provides an element of damage which the owner should recover, irrespective of the value of the animal because of its specialized training. The respondent tries to distinguish between curtsy, super, and the instant one on two bases, namely in, the, in that the former of a body of a child was taken into the latter of a dog, that in the former there was a personal, personal transaction between the undertaker and complainant, while the latter there was none since the garbage gatherer did not even know the plaintiff anywhere within sight, nor he had ever met her or seen the dog previously. As to one of these first to say that the anguish resulting from the mishandling of a body of a child cannot be equated to the grief from the loss of a dog, but that does not imply that mental suffering from a loss of a pet dog, even one a less aristocrat than Heidi, is nothing at all. As for this matter of conduct between miscreant and the injured person, the attempted jurisdiction is just too fine for us to accept. Your Honor, as you can see, and I kind of crossed over into trespass to chattels while I was at it, uh, Your Honor, that the Supreme, the Florida Supreme Court has held that, yeah, you can recover for the loss of a pet. And that's what we had here. Mr. Dieterle's dog was shot and killed right in front of him. The shock stayed with him throughout the entire day. Dr. Ellis saw it. Dr. Morris saw it. And he himself, and even the defendant, saw it. And that stayed with him for years on end. We talk about how there's not a coincidence between uh, sending a non-party request on 813 and then going to the doctor's 815. I wouldn't be able to put those days together and remember that if not for the fact August 13th is in fact my birthday. But to me, Your Honor, this notion that he didn't actually suffer emotional distress is just not, not what the facts have told us. It's not what Dr. Edlin told us. It's not what Cindy Watson told us. And it's not what Rod Jacobson told us. Thank you, Your Honor. Next count. Uh, next count, Your Honor, will be count two for negligence. And I'll handle this uh, as a whole, Your Honor, beginning with the underlying action uh, for negligence. In his amended complaint, the plaintiff seeks to recover damages for emotional pain and suffering as a result of Mr. Dieterle's alleged negligence. For the following reasons, Mr. Dieterle is entitled to a directed verdict with regard to the plaintiff's ability to recover damages for emotional pain and suffering as a result of Mr. Dieterle's alleged negligence. I quote, the impact rule as applied in Florida The impact rule as applied in Florida requires that before a plaintiff can recover damages for emotional distress caused by the negligence of another, the emotional distress must flow from physical injuries the plaintiff sustained in an impact. And that is Florida Department of Corrections v. Abril 969 Southern 2nd 201 found at 206. That's a Florida Supreme Court case that quotes another Florida Supreme Court case, R.J. v. Humana of Florida Incorporated, 652 Southern 2nd, 360, 
found at page 362. I quote, and I place emphasis on this, the rule actually requires some impact on the plaintiff or in certain, certain, certain situations, the manifestation of severe emotional distress, such as physical injuries or illness. There are exceptions to the impact rule, but none of the exceptions are applicable here in this case. The, weather, the issue of whether the impact rule bars a cause of action is a matter of law for the trial court to determine, and that's Villar v. O-L-A-Z-A-B-A-L, found at 675 Southern 2nd, 710 at page 711, wherein the appellate court affirmed the trial court's order dismissing the plaintiff's complaint because as a matter of law, the impact rule bars these causes of action and the facts of this case do not fall within the narrow exceptions to the impact rule. The plaintiff testified during his testimony that nothing touched him. Not a single thing, nothing. As a result, he suffered no impact. What were the facts in that case you just cited? Uh, I'd have to pull up the case, Your Honor. I apologize. It's actually not this one. Let me pull it up there. Would you like the procedural history, Your Honor? No, I just want to know what, what the factual issue was that uh, was alleged to be an exception to the impact rule. I don't know, Your Honor, only because the opinion itself states, and I quote, as a matter of law, the impact rule bars these causes of actions, and the facts of this case do not fall within the narrow exceptions to the impact rule. And that is... Um, they, just, they just didn't recite the, the complaint that was dismissed? <laughs> Correct. I mean, the entire opinion is just two sentences long. That's fine. The plaintiff admits that Mr. Dieterle did not cause him any physical injuries because Mr. Dieterle did not touch him in any way and nothing touched him. Even when viewing this fact in the light most favorable to the plaintiff, the plaintiff is still barred as a matter of law from recovering the damages he seeks from Mr. Dieterle from the alleged negligence. And with, re I guess I can discuss the punitive damages aspect of it as well. Uh, with regard to negligence, you must show gross negligence in order to be awarded punitive damages. Under the statute, the definition of gross negligence is the defendant's conduct was so reckless or wanting in care that it constituted a conscious disregard or indifference to the life, safety, or rights of persons exposed to such conduct. Uh, that is obviously subject to the clear and convincing standard and given the testimony and the evidence that's been presented from the sheriff's office who conducted an investigation into this matter and found that Mr. Dieterle's actions were justified and conducted lawfully, I do not see how the plaintiff can uh, meet that very high clear and convincing standard with regard to showing gross negligence for count two, Your Honor. Uh, as a result, we would move for a directed verdict at, uh, at, pertaining to count two both for the underlying count and for the punitive damages associated with that count. All right, Mr. Timpani. Yes, Your Honor, as you heard, the standard being gross negligence, as you, as you could hear, the, our conduct was outrageous. It's clear, it was clear based on what we heard in testimony in the plaintiff's case <coughs> that the defendant did not actually need to shoot this dog and that he didn't just shoot it once he shot it multiple times. He didn't even th th thought he hit it. He had a duty to Mr. Dieterle that clearly, uh, obviously it doesn't matter for really a direct verdict, they, know, they knew he knew whose dog it was and he didn't use everything in his power. Uh, based on what we heard from the plaintiff, Your Honor, Mr. Dieterle shot numerous times and continued to shoot uh, the dog. And as we heard from Dr. Ellis, again, it was in the side. The, the act of shooting a firearm and discharging it in the presence of another individual is in and itself 
gross and outrageous conduct. And not just one shot while I was lunging, which wasn't the case clearly, considering where the bullet that actually killed Candy the dog was actually located, according to Dr. Ellis, but it was numerous shots. And the defendants, and another thing, as to the Sarasota Sheriff's Office, that standard which they use to uh, charge individuals, they have to decide whether or not they can prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. Because if you charge someone and you can't prove it, you're, if you can't prove the elements beyond a reasonable doubt, the individual is not going to be convicted. To be able to charge, and this is obviously from criminal law, all you need is pro a probable cause, a good faith basis that you can prove the charge. However, part of what it is is you have to be able to know that you can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Because if you charge it and you can't meet the standard, it's not even going to get past a... It's not going to get to a jury to be able to find him guilty or not. So this notion that, oh, the sheriff's, like the sheriff's office didn't find, they didn't charge him, all right, that's, that's perfectly fair in fact, but they're going on a different standard than we are. This is clear and convincing evidence is a much lower standard, significantly, than beyond a reasonable doubt. We're not applying a criminal standard. This is a civil case. And, Your Honor, the actions by the defendant as, obviously, uh, everything that happened in the defendant's case is not relevant for directed verdict, but everything that we heard from Mr. Jacobson, the defendant's conduct was outrageous and extremely reckless, an extreme disregard for human right, life, and life of property, which is, in fact, was Candy the dog. Let me ask this question. Uh... Mr. Timpanic, on the, on the punitive damages part of it. Uh, we, we covered this, I think, in pretrial, but if we were to go ahead with punitive damages, I don't recall the defendant having a positive net worth. And, Your Honor, as I stated in Brooks v. Rios, that's, I'll, I'll read it off to you because this is the controlling standard. Uh, which citation is that? Brooks v. Rios, 707, Southern 2nd, 374. Hold on. And, I'll, and I will read this off, and it has some string cites so we can take a look at those. A defendant against, punitive da against whom punitive damages are sought, however, must present evidence as to his or her net worth at trial to preclude a jury from assessing an unduly harsh penalty as to preserve his, his or her right to argue the excessiveness of the punitive damage award on appeal. And that's, we're going to see bold, 349 Southern, 2nd, 1187, Turner v. Fitzsimmons, 673 Southern 2nd 532, page 536, Florida 1st DCA, Reddy v. Green, 546, Southern 2nd, 410, 421, Southern Community Court v. Reddy, 553, Southern 2nd, 1166, Florida 1989, Albritton, 531, Southern 2nd at 339. We, we, we don't need the string citations. And as your honor, it just <clears throat> goes on and on. Yeah, and but, uh, my question is, um, let's assume, let's play it forward, let's assume that punitive damages is allowed. What are you going to ask for? Your Honor, that had, that, like I said, that determination has not been decided by me, and I haven't spoken, but it's not, I'm not going to be asking for $10 million. I'll just tell you that. That's not a reasonable award, but, um, your Honor, and, and, and this is additionally, Your Honor, this is from the, the case, and this is important. In the apps, and th this might actually end up having um, Mr. Dieterle potentially re retake the stand. In the absence of sufficient evidence as to the defendant's net worth, an appellate court cannot say that a ward is excessive, and that's bold. So that's a situation where because he took the stand and there was no, not, no speak, uh, obviously that's, that'll be later on because this we're kind of talking about a directed verdict, we're also talking about punitive damages. That was just as a note. Well, I, I know, I'm just, I'm just saying that um, we don't want to be in a situation where we ask the jury to 
make a finding on punitive damages if there's no evidentiary basis for an award. Yes, Your Honor. And I, I was asking, and, and again, you've done discovery, and my understanding was reported back that there, he, he doesn't have a net worth that could sustain any uh, punitive damages. I don't know. Uh, Mr. Kessler, refresh me on what the evidence was on the discovery. Uh, the evidence was is that the only asset that he has is the constitutionally protected homestead. Uh, all the other assets were leveraged and the client had a ne negative net worth uh, other than the house. Well, is, do you have any other evidence of his net worth other than what Mr. Kessler has outlined? No, Your Honor, but that, like I said, right now as it stands, Based on this case law, that doesn't actually matter. That's for him to prove. So for, as we talk about punitive damages right now, that's, we're not in a, we're not in a position to actually have to prove anything for him. Well, but what we'd be asking for, and your, as you can understand, Your Honor, uh, if we, the jury were to award punitive damages and you, Your Honor, made a finding as to what you, we've discussed, that's obviously a potential appellate issue, but for our sake, it's we're not in a position to be choosing. It's like, okay, well, uh, we know that he has a negative net worth from discovery. The jury doesn't know that, and an appellate court wouldn't either. Well, you know that. I, I, I know that, Your Honor, but I'm not the fact finder. I'm not the well, one who determines what a punitive damage award would be. I know that, but there has to be a fact, uh, evidentiary basis um, I, I put it like this, there has to be a uh, sum against which I can measure whether it's excessive or not. And if that is zero, how can we go through that exercise? Your Honor, are you, I'm trying to figure out, are you asking me to give an actual number what I'm going to ask for? Well, whatever you ask for, if, if, if all he has is a homestead and everything else is negative, then you could ask for a thousand dollars, and it there's no evidentiary basis for him to pay even that. Well, Your Honor, as it stands right now, that wouldn't be the case on appeal because any award that you would say you uh, right now you set it aside, Your Honor, uh, after the case, uh, based on what we've already heard, it wouldn't it wouldn't allow appellate scrutiny wouldn't allow for that to stand. Well. The appellate court would say what was his net worth and whether the jury awarded something in excess of uh, what he could pay, and there would be zero. And, Your Honor, like I said, uh, that's for a jury to decide if you, like I said, if you, the court does not find that his actions do not, uh, the case law, or whatever. Uh, dealing with punitive damages, that's for you to decide, but we're not at that point, Your Honor. No, let, let me put it this way. Let's, let's just assume this is the most egregious act, most outrageous act that could ever happen, but he has a negative net worth. How can punitive damages be confirmed against him? Your Honor, that would, like you said, that would be something the fact finder would decide, and you, Your Honor, as the gatekeeper, would decide whether or not it was warranted. Well, I'm just puzzled over the process here because typically when we have a punitive damages case, we have a responsive defendant that presumably has pockets deep enough to sustain a claim for punitive damages. This is the first case I've had where the claim has been made against some, someone who uh, parties have indicated basically only has a homestead which is protected by the Constitution. So I'm just curious as to, I know I'm being a little preemptive on it, but it seems to me that we need to address or at least consider that issue. Um, you know, maybe it is premature, but uh, I don't see a great value in instructing a jury, even if you're able to sustain your other arguments on punitive damages, uh, how that's um, consistent with logic. Um, Anyway, I, that's, I, I'm not making a decision on it. It just strikes me that way. And anyway, I'll get back to, uh, okay, I've heard your argument on the negligence. Did you have anything you want to add on the, on the net worth issue? Uh, 
I mean, no, Your Honor, other than my client has a negative net worth when you exclude the uh, homestead issue. I, I agree entirely with the court that uh, the exercise of going through it to get to the end and have a negative net worth and have a jury that can't award any uh, punitive damages, even if they do find that punitive damages are warranted, I believe is a, a waste of time in the court's judicial resources. Well, I'll think about it. I, I don't know exactly what to do with that situation, but I'm going to, I want to give it some thought. All right, what's the next count? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. The uh, defendant, Mr. Deedley, would be moving for a directed verdict on count three, the assault claim. Your Honor has the memorandum of law that was filed pretrial along with the case law in there. And under the second DCA case of McDonald v. Ford, citation 223 Southern 2nd 553, an assault is defined as an intentional unlawful offer of corporal injury to another by force or force unlawfully directed toward the person of another under such circumstances as to create a fear of imminent peril coupled with the apparent present ability to effectuate the attempt. Taking the evidence most favorable to the plaintiff under the plaintiff's case in chief, there is absolutely no evidence that plaintiff has met the intent element to prove assault. The plaintiff's testimony was that Zach never pointed the gun at him, yet the plaintiff it, under his pleadings in the amended complaint said in paragraph 35, Dieterle proceeded to point his gun in the direction of Jacobson and to repeatedly fire the gun in Jacobson's direction. And although the bullets discharged by Dieterle's gun did not strike Jacobson, they nearly struck Jacobson and they did not strike the motor vehicle and his dog. The plaintiff's testimony was that the gun was never pointed at him. The plaintiff said that he was never threatened by Zach and in fact that they were standing next to each other and aligned and he testified that he did not know that he had a gun until it was fired and the plaintiff has presented no evidence that Zach intended to put him to harm him or that he intended to make him in apprehension of harm and as Mr. Kessler indicated on the negligence claim nothing ever touched the plaintiff and that was his testimony. And so even though he's alleged in paragraph 36 that he intended, that Zach intended to put him in fear, there's zero evidence of that. In paragraph 37 says that Zach willfully and maliciously aimed and discharged the gun at Jacobson, which here in court, that is the exact opposite of what happened. And so based upon the allegations and the amended complaint, he cannot meet those elements. We've also provided the court with the um, Spivey v. Battaglia decision, 258 Southern 2nd, 815, that's a Florida Supreme Court, and the standard is an ordinary reasonable person, whether that person would have felt that a certain result uh, was certain to follow. And it says simply having a knowledge and appreciation of a risk does not mean a result is substantially certain to follow. To satisfy the intent element, the plaintiff must prove that the defendant did an act that was substantially certain to put the plaintiff in fear of imminent violence, not that the defendant had the intent to do violence. And so the fact that plaintiff's own testimony, one, refutes what he alleged in the lawsuit, but also that Zach never threatened him. Zach never pointed the gun at him, and certainly Zach never shot the gun at him. He cannot meet the uh, elements to prove uh, the cause of action for assault. And we've also provided the Watley v. Florida Power and Light Company case, also in the Memorandum of Law, 192 Southern 2nd 27, which says, mere assertions of a phenomenon that is physically impossible do not give rise to a cause of action. In other words, the plaintiff testified he didn't even know Zach had a gun on him until it was shot, and so he could not have been in fear or apprehension not knowing that he had a gun. And for all of these reasons, the plaintiff has not met the elements um, to prove cause of action for assault under count three, and we would ask that a directed verdict be entered. All right, Mr. Timpani. Your Honor, as we heard during the case in chief from Mr. Jacobson, the first shot was fired, and he immediately knew what he actually heard was a weapon. It's only a few feet away from Mr. Dieterle, because obviously we're still in the plaintiff's case. They were uh, shoulder to shoulder. Shoulder to shoulder, Your Honor. Yeah. As evident and as stated by law enforcement, they 
It's obviously contradictory to what the defendant said, but we're obviously still in the plaintiff's case. He was, Mr. Jacobson served in the Coast Guard. He knew exactly what a gunshot sounded like. And after the first one, it wasn't just one gunshot that he had no idea. It was at least three gunshots, Your Honor. And even after those where he stated on the stand that he was put in fear for his life based on the gunshots, Mr. Dieterle didn't stop there. And as you also heard, based on the language he did, and obviously I think I've said the language enough for one day about what Mr. Dieterle said, but one of the Mr. Jacobson said on the stand was he was waving the gun at him, calling him obviously a fucking moron. And he's waving the gun at him. Your Honor, that action itself is assault. In fact, it's aggravated assault with a firearm. But obviously, we're not in a criminal case. We're just in assault and a reasonable apprehension of imminent offensive contact. Your Honor, as we heard, there's no doubt Mr. Jacobson was right there when his dog was shot and killed, shot numerous times by defendant. It is entirely reasonable for a person to be put in fear of gunshots even though they don't see the first shot fired. Otherwise, and this is obviously pulling from world world events, you wouldn't be able to say that to the victims in Nervalde or Buffalo, Your Honor. Obviously, that's different situations here, Your Honor, but those are gunshots going off within only a few feet of Mr. Jacobson. And when he comes back, he just saw, saw Mr. J, uh, Mr. Dieterle shoot his dog. He had absolutely a reasonable fear that he could be next based on how the defendant was handling his firearm. The words he was saying, the reaction when he said, did you shoot my dog? You're damn right I did and I'd do it again. That's undisputed. Mr. Jacobson said that. Mr. Dieterle said that from the stand. His own deposition, he said that. That is undisputed based on that language, based on the presence of a firearm, the multiple shots, and the profanity used by defendant. Mr. Dieter, Mr. Jacobson is absolutely justified in believing a reasonable fear of imminent offensive contact. And we'd be asking you to deny their motion for directed verdict as to the assault count. Your Honor, I think it's entirely inappropriate to reference a national tragedy. It has nothing to do with this case, yeah. and other than the fact that there's a camera behind us. Well, go ahead and... and uh, Briefly, as to the merits, Your Honor, I've provided the Watley v. Florida Power and Light Company decision that I referenced before. Behavior, they specifically state, um, and also in the Sullivan case, behavior that does not include a threat to do harm is not considered eminent. There was... There's no evidence of an imminent harm because the plaintiff testified Zach never threatened him and he never pointed the gun at him and because of that he cannot prove assault. Counsel is asserting that uh, the testimony was that uh, Mr. Dearly was waving the gun at the plaintiff. Do you recall that testimony? I don't know that he said he was waving the gun at plaintiff. I think he said he might have waved the gun but his testimony was he never pointed the gun at him, so I don't know how he could be waving it at him if the testimony is he never pointed it at him. Uh, I, I, I can't instantly, but I can pull up the transcript of what exactly was said. Do you have dailies? I do have. Can we search it on there? Sure. Okay. Well, I'm just asking. It would help me to have that. We do have uh, Mr. Jacobson's testimony that we can provide the court. Well, um, if you want to copy that, um, do, you, do you need it also? I mean, I, I, we have the capabilities of getting another copy. Okay, uh, just show it to Mr. Tim oh. Panic. Make sure he concurs that that's an accurate transcript. I'm sure Richard was on the ball, but wait and see. Uh, Your Honor, I'm reading from the transcript. You, uh, you don't need to, I'm just... Oh, yeah, no, page 16, I think that's what you're looking for, uh, roughly halfway down. 
Paul, I think that's what you're looking for. Well, I'm going to, obviously, I'm not going to make a ruling today. I'm going to have to. As I understandably so, Your Honor. You just put it down there. Thank you. All right. Uh, anything else, Ms. Johnson? Well, I, I, I think the plaintiff should be held to the allegations in the complaint, cannot create new um, claims of assault here in court. Paragraph 37, the allegation was, Dieterle willfully and maliciously aimed and discharged the gun at Jacobson, which his testimony is the opposite, intending to put him ap in apprehension of immediate harmful conduct. And now they're saying, well, it was the waving of the gun. That's not in their pleadings. Um, and and the, the evidence is exactly opposite of their pleadings in paragraph seven, 37. And as to the uh, request for punitives on the assault, I would reiterate the arguments that Mr. Kessler has already made. Okay. How about the trespass? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Deedley moves for a directed verdict on count four, trespass to chattels. That has been renamed okay. trespass to personal property. Yes. Your Honor has in the binder that was provided this afternoon at tab five, the Coddington case. And the elements to state a cause of action for trespass to personal property is the intentional use of or interference with a chattel, personal property, which is in the possession of another without justification. And I'm going to break this argument up into uh, two subjects, one being the truck and then the second being the dog, both um, personal property. As to the truck, the plaintiff's testimony was that he assumed, in his direct testimony, he said he assumed the flat tire was from the gunshot. In cross-examination, he confirmed that he did not know what caused the tire damage. And so the plaintiff has not proven um, that Zach shot the truck or that he um, intentionally interfered with his possession of the truck. And for that reason, uh, he has not stated a, a cause of action, or he has not um, brought forth sufficient evidence to overcome a directed verdict. As to the trespass to personal property relating to the dog, the Coddington case is clear that emotional distress damages are not recoverable in an action for trespass to personal property. And um, at the bottom of the decision where the injury consists in the wrongful taking of chattels, personal property, from the possession of another, the measure of damages is the value of the goods at the time and place of the wrongful taking and removal. Taking the evidence most favorably in favor of the plaintiff, there is absolutely evidence as to um, the measure of damages as to the value of the dog. There was zero evidence presented as to um, the adoption fee that was paid or what the owner felt the, the, the monetary um, value of the dog was and so there's cannot meet that element of measure of damages and for that reason directed verdict should be on the dog as personal property as well as the truck. All right, Mr. Tim Tannick. Your Honor, as to the trespass, the chattels, the restrict, as I will, as I stated earlier, the restriction of the loss of a pet to its intrinsic value in circumstances such as loved one brings us with a principle we cannot accept. Without indulging in a discussion of the affinity between sentimental value and mental suffering, we feel that the affection, affection of a master for his dog is a very real thing and that the malicious destruction of the pet provides an element of damage for which the owner should recover irrespective of the value because of its special trend. Because, yes, dog. And your honor, when looking at this, what we introduced is what was the direct result of defendant's trespass to personal property being the dog. The dog was a rescue, Your Honor. That would be a nominal fee. I don't even think there was one because the dog was actually going to be euthanized if somebody didn't take it. The intrinsic value of it cannot possibly, and the sentimental value, cannot possibly monetarily been put down by anyone. Well, Ken is immediately following the trespass of chattels, the trespass personal property, what Mr. Jacobson had to do to try to repair the destruction of this. And as we heard, undisputed, he went to Blue Pearl, Sarasota, spent roughly $2,700. He went to Blue Pearl, Tampa, 
spent $5,500, Your Honor. Those valuations are what that actually cost him. That is what his actual damages were, not a nominal adoption fee, even if there was one, but what Mr. Jacobson had to do to try to save his dog, Your Honor. And as you heard from that case, this case is exactly on point. And I implore you to look at it and deny defense's motion for judge, uh, directed verdict you as to trespass to chattels. You're citing Brooks? Yeah, uh, no, this is Laporta. Brooks is the punitive damages. Uh, that 163? 163 Southern 2nd, 267. Okay. Ms. Johnson, are you familiar with Laporte? I am not familiar with Laporte, that. Laporte, sorry, Your Honor. I do not believe that was a trespass to personal property case. The Coddington case out of the 4th District is very clear. They talk about the elements of trespass to personal property and the measure of damages, again, is the value of the goods at the time and place of the wrongful taking, which would be the value of the personal property, the dog, at the time it was shot. There's zero evidence of that value. The damages is not what you paid for it after the fact or any other um, of, of the um, suggestions made by plaintiff's counsel. The measure of damages, Coddington is clear, the value of the goods at the time. And as to, again, Your Honor, uh, for the record, regarding punitive damages, I would reiterate the arguments made by Mr. Kessler for count four. Anything further? No, Your Honor. Mr. Kessler? Nothing, Your Honor. All right. Well, you've given me 13 or more cases to read, so I'll do this over the weekend and study it. Uh, thank you for your argument, and stay tuned. The rest of the witnesses are live, no, no Zoom issues, right? That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. All right, we'll stand recess. All rise. Courts are recess for the weekend. <laughs>